Greetings, dispersed beings of planet Earth. Welcome to the podcast. My guest today is the extremely charming, charismatic, and extroverted Brogan Graham, who, in addition to being kind of a style icon, a guy with his own gravitational field, and also an exceptional host during my April visit to Minneapolis, which was all his idea, by the way. Brogan is also the co-founder of November Project, which is a free, open, urban, outdoor space, open to the public, gung-ho, group-led, script flipping global fitness movement thing, basically a collective of communities that today counts over 250,000 lifetime members in 52 cities in nine countries all over the world. This conversation covers a lot of ground. It's about many things, dadding, friendship, building community, getting outside your comfort zone, not just in the context of fitness, but in all aspects of life. If there is a general theme to this one, it's, about the importance of always seeking friendship, cultivating inclusivity and calling people in rather than calling them out. As I'm fond of saying, prophets walk among us. Brogan is definitely one of them. I love this dude, I dig this conversation. So pretty please hit that subscribe button. We just eclipsed half a million subscribers. So thank you all for that. Next stop 1 million and enjoy this episode of my bromance with Brogan Graham. Brogan Graham. Rich Roll, the Rich Roll podcast. We are in Minneapolis. What are we doing here? I, I think I convinced you to come visit. You did. And I, I just pulled out all the stops and <laughs> I am <laughs> shocked that you're here. We're here solely by dint of your efforts, but I'm super excited to be here, man. I can't, I cool. actually can't believe that you're here. I, I, you didn't think it would happen. Well, well, I kept baiting you to make it sound like I was gonna pull the plug at the last minute. Other than the weather, it snowed this morning. It's all right. I know, bad. but I, after all those years in Southern California, like weather is a thing. Meaning, meaning it like- is, It is the end of April. You would think the sun might peak out a little bit, but maybe not so much. And I went to a workout this morning and I was like, I was like looking for other folks to like talk. I was like, there's snow on the ground. I was like, are we, are we not talking about this? Uh huh. And it was very uncool. Like I was exposing myself as like a recent- <laughs> You've lived here long enough. I mean, a year and a half. That should be something that isn't worthy of being all that. Yeah, but I, I stopped asking. I was like, okay, this is very uncool. Uh -huh. It's anyway. gotta be sort of April. Well, March has gotta be terrible. Cause that's when you think, oh, it's March, it's spring now. Right. It's you all gonna one, start shifting yeah. and then you get slammed. You get one right? weekend that's like 60 or 70 degrees and like Minnesotans are wearing shorts and like we're thrilled. Uh huh. And then it's like, oh, I think it's summer. I think we're just in. Yeah. And then it's- But you're like the guy who's wearing shorts year round anyway. Some of that. Pull the mic up a little bit closer to you. Like that? Not that your voice isn't booming. Well, I, with the microphone thing, I always, I also go like really, I go hard into it, you know? That's the way you live your life. Um, I am, uh, <laughs> I'm pumped to be on. It's been four years. Uh-huh. It's been four years. Yeah. And that's honestly, like it's weird. That's the only time I've actually met you. No, that's not true. Oh, because I went to that November project I dragged project you to That's West right. LA. Yeah, I'm still recovering from that. Uh-huh, West LA. That was at least three years I think ago. That was a, that, I think that was two years later. Was so we're internet later? friends. We are. And then we took a stab at doing a little remote recording that I was gonna append to the top of a podcast right. about being a dad. And that was, <laughs> that was one year ago. Let's talk about that for a yeah. second. You called me, I think in Jill, June or July or something. It must have been June. And you were like, yeah, I wanna add, I'm gonna start doing these shorter clips to add to other podcasts that you've like, that were upcoming. Uh -huh. and, I, and I was hesitant, I was like, Rich, man, like it's a pretty intense time here. I don't, are we doing this? And you're like, yeah, and we recorded it. And then it was just like- And then, and then Minneapolis exploded. Minneapolis exploded. Like, There's no way. And I then you call me back and you're like, like sorry. This, we can't, sorry, we can't we, use this. Sorry. Yeah. So anyway. So that's it, a good, that's a good lead in to addressing the elephant in the room. Uh, I, I definitely wanna open this by, by <laughs> saying out loud that I'm not sure anybody needs to hear from two white cisgender, upwardly mobile, suburban dwelling dads, uh, you know. Who are already taking up space. <laughs> right, already taking up space, white space. Right. To, you know, bro out on a curfew imposed Minneapolis 
in the middle of a COVID spike, the Dwayne Wright shooting and the Chauvin trial. Uh, does anybody need to hear you know, our opinions on racial justice, Black Lives Matter, civil rights? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but we're here and it's rolling we are. and, and um, I think that there's some value in conversation. You talk about it all the time. It's yeah. like, I uh, have grown to really appreciate you as a host and as someone who brings not only people together, but like the best out of those people. And, and, um, and to sit and have a conversation. And like, you know, we talked about on the way over here, it's like, or the last couple of days leading up to this, it's like, you know, there's also a lot of life that's going on here in Minneapolis that applies elsewhere. Right. Opinions and things that we're kind of trying to sort through as mm -hmm. middle-aged white dudes. I, you know, th there's, I think that there's a ton of value. So, so, so to you and your crew, thank you for coming here. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I would have come here just to interview you, though. That was—that's not. No, I, I mean, think you, you put in motion. Out. You put in motion this opportunity to sit down with with Mayor Jacob Fry. Um, that was kind of the instigating impulse. Um, of course, coming here, then you know, it became uh, our responsibility to find um, community leaders of color to talk to. Yep. It wouldn't have been great to just interview the mayor and not get, uh, you know, a. a a differing point of view For or a sure. perspective of somebody who, you know, is really immersed in the movement and the community. So we're doing that as well. We're recording this one first though. So I don't have the experience right. of having sat down with those folks right. yet. We will release this afterwards. And though. I also have this feeling like the, the, the recording from a year ago that didn't ever see the light of day, that there's a chance that this might not see the light of day. Mm. So if this gets banked and we- No, this, this is gonna go up. But what's interesting about that experience, I think reflecting back on that, I, I recognize my level of disengagement and ignorance or naivete, I, should, I, sh I guess I should say, around exactly what was happening here and the import of it nationally and internationally that it's become. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, th I thought of that because I remember having that conversation with you where I was like, I, I was hesitant because I, I well, you were boots on the ground here. So you had a tactile we connection. Had, we were living in Uptown closer. and um, we were about uh, a little less than half a mile away from George Floyd, from Cup Foods, from George, what is now George Floyd Square. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's two things with that. When you, when you talk about that, there's the piece that's about, you know, understanding how outraged this city was. Okay, there's that piece. But then there's also a piece about like uh, large scale crimes and, and terrorism that happened way down the road. Like I remember, I remember hearing about certain things growing up and feeling like Oklahoma City is a million miles away. That's hard to wrap my brain around, you know? And when the, when the Twin Towers came down, like I was living in Boston, I felt a lot mm -hmm. closer, but we weren't in New York City and like the whole world was shooken by that. But like, is it different to be closer? And so to have those conversations with you, like it was, um, it felt weird. It was like I don't know that we're having. I don't know. That, I don't know that we were connecting on the same. Yeah, on the same, we were not. not well, we weren't because experience. I didn't. I didn't understand what was actually happening. And then fast forward. I think not even a couple weeks, and all cities. It, yeah, it became a very different picture quickly for everybody. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And um, you know, going back to how you kicked this show off, like I, I was um, one of my highest council members, my mother Anne. Uh -huh. I told her she's a huge fan and I told her that you were coming here. She's like, oh, great. Like she thinks we're all just friends from like her front driveway playing basketball growing up. Like she <laughs> pretends like we're all- It all bleeds together. Oh, Rich is coming, you know, it's like it wasn't that big of a deal, but she said, well, I hope you guys um, don't end up looking like idiots. She said that. <laughs> There's a very good chance that's exactly what's gonna right. happen. So she if just said, she, said she goes, well, I'm really proud card. of him. I'm glad, I'm glad he's engaged. And, and like, I don't know how much of this you've done where you go to like where it is, like this is like, no, I've, I mean, I've gone to cities and done podcasts in cities, but they haven't been event driven. Right. You know, so this is unique and different in that regard. And on some level, I think it's, it's a reaction to the world having been shut down the past year and being unable to travel, which is something I love doing. Mm. And we had a tour set up. We were gonna do live events in like six cities. So that didn't happen. Right. Um, but on top of that, and, and most importantly, just a recognition of the significance of what's going on here. The fact that the whole world is is watching, you know, moment to moment what's yep. transpiring here. It just felt prescient and important. And yeah. the opportunity arose because of you. And I couldn't say no to that. Yeah, and I was I was stoked. Well and I But and I do I, want to get it right too. So I feel that I feel that responsibility. But that's that a white guy thing. 
is it? And I'm not so trying to walk, teach walk anybody. I'm that. not trying to teach anybody. Well, but you've, that's a, you've kind of done some training around this, right? Not, some yeah, formal we're, training. We're not supposed to talk about the work. Mm, okay, that's part of the but training too. Do it, too. and then like tell <laughs> some piece. Some. T- All right. um, I think that the the idea of perfectionism, the idea of getting it right, the idea of like having a messy conversation perfectly is like, well, that that's nearly impossible, especially for mm-hmm. white folks that haven't handled race the same way and have lived a pretty easy life here right. in the United States. Like to, to, to think that like, we're gonna step into an arena and like get it all right. <laughs> like you, you, there will be missteps on this mm-hmm. trip and in mm-hmm. these conversations and on my side. And like, you know, one of the things that one of the uh, equity advisors for November Project told me today was like, acknowledge at the top, acknowledge at the top of the show. And you sort of did it, but I'll do it again for myself, for both of us. Like. What if you were launching into a conversation where you're going to make mistakes? Like, like not like, oh, if we have a mistake on these topics, and I don't even know which ones we'll cover, but like, if we have one, then we'll, no, no, no. Let's just assume we're going to make mistakes because you and I are both new mm-hmm. to this. Like, it's embarrassing, right? But it's probably better to proceed going towards some mistakes, but in the right direction than like, ooh, let's freeze up until... You know, yeah. Rich, Rich, I well, you get it. all you get all rigid because totally. you want to say the right thing, and then the conversation really doesn't end up going anywhere right. because you're 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 coming from a place of fear. And if right. there's one thing that I've kind of learned or gleaned from conversations that I've had over the last twelve months on this subject, it's that um, it's exactly what you said. Like you can't be afraid to have the conversation. Right. It's acknowledging you're not going to get it perfectly. I think there's a there is a, a trepidation with a lot of white people, they wanna talk about it, but, but that fear prevents them from even having the conversation yep. because they don't wanna get it wrong. They don't wanna get castigated for saying the wrong thing. And so those conversations never transpire. Yep. And then, and then those out there that are like, yeah, I wanna, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm gonna do the reading and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it right and I'm gonna figure it out. And then I'm gonna engage and they engage <laughs> and they engage and they get it wrong and they get called out or, or called a racist or critiqued or, and then. And then the white fragility of flares uh, like, up. Like I'm, you know, I'm trying, why are you taking me down? But it's not the responsibility right. of the black community to right. give you a pat on the back and right. say, good job. Right, yeah. and if we're living this like yeah. insular like existence of like, of, of white privilege that puts you in a place where like you've, you know, you've practiced your whole life not taking criticism. And so the, it really like, it, it doubly hurts. It's 10 mm-hmm. times, I'm not used to this. It's like, well, well, you, well, you should enter into these, enter the real world a little bit, you know? Uh-huh. And and uh, look, it sounds as if I'm like coming from a place of experience. I, I am when it comes to messing up, you know? Like when it comes to doing the wrong things and and uh, proceeding, you know, as if I I, I know the whole picture, but it's it's, the way I've looked at you know building community and the way I've looked at November mm-hmm. Project has been through the lens of of who I am and running of who I am and it was in Boston and and kind of how I I saw bringing a group together and, and how to supercharge a group and and so you know I I don't take credit or responsibility for for all of November Project but I think it was um it was built by two white guys and I, and I think and there's another thing that you know Somia and I spoke about today is like. For my for my white friends out there that look at November Project and just say, "That's fun. It's just fun. You know, it's it, it's not racist. It's it just it's it's a free community thing. Like people should show up if they can, and and they, if they can't, they can't. And it's mm-hmm. it's for everyone. And it's just it's good. I would say, um, it was comfortable for us. We chose locations for us, and we chose. Um, to 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 bring people together in the only way we knew how, and we did it with with our language and our social media, and and um, the group is is uh, is formed by two cisgendered white guys, two rowers in Boston, yeah. like and, and, like and, that, and, that that northeastern kind totally. of like fancy school pedigree. And when I when I'm having the beginning of this story, and I can tell it's not landing, I say, how, could could two black men have? Could two shirtless black men have gone into the Harvard Stadium and built a group of three, four, five hundred people that were screaming and and uh, and and you know waking up the neighborhood with booming fuck yes and like hugging it out and just having the best time and uh, 
you know, what would that look like? Like, what, how, how would that have looked? And I'm not talking about Harvard University. I'm not talking about Boston Police Department. I'm not talking about the neighbors in, in, the, in the residing areas. I'm talking about all of it. And, and, um, and, I, and I think that kind of helps frame it as far as like, the be- from, from the beginning, we were mm-hmm. operating with white privilege. Is the mm-hmm. Harvard Stadium open to train in? Well, it's open. Mm-hmm. So we go in mm-hmm. and we make it our home. And yeah. that's a very privileged way of operating. Yeah. You know, that's a super interesting perspective on it. I mean, that, that takes a lot of maturity to kind of own that aspect of it because it is easy. And on some level, you could make the argument correct to just say, look, we just, we put this thing together and anybody can come. Like there's no, there's no closed doors to anybody, but to step back and, and really objectively deconstruct that from a systemic perspective to kind of own that. Um, I imagine that took some work to get to that place. And then, the, and then of course the question becomes, where do you go from there, right? Like how do you, not to say that you did anything wrong, but acknowledging that you could do better, like what are the steps you put in place? Because it is all about community. Community is the bed, bread and butter of the whole November project. That's the ethos sure. of it. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you like broaden that aperture to make it more welcoming to all well, comers? I think even just laying out that that context of like what it, what it is, who it's for, and I, th- I think um, community members and leaders, people who have been once, people who are diehards, like if we can't see that access that we've had, if we can't see, you know, one of my favorite stories from the Boston days was like this police officer came and told us never to come back to this hill again, and mm-hmm. I, I I assured him we would seven exactly seven days from then. And I, I'm like talking to this guy with no shirt on, like just uh-huh. barely respectful, but like kind of having fun with the conversation. And he said, you know, if you, I'm gonna write you a warning today and if you come back, it's gonna be to a couple hundred dollar ticket. Because it's too loud or yeah, I mean, it's a well, public it's, space, right? Yeah, but, so he said neighbors have complained and I said, I don't think that they have. And he goes, well, you, you know, it's a sound or, ordinance viol- you know, violation. And I was like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that. And he, he's like, well, just don't come back. And I said, I'll see you seven days from now. Mm. And this defiant nature of like, like how, you know, the coolness of like being kind of just rad and like laugh in the face of authority. Like I, I need our community to see that that's how we built this. Like I need, I need our community to like, look at that as white privilege. And if like, and if you don't want to come along on that ride, like that's going to be hard. But your question was like, how do you go about and change that? I mean, you can't change the origin story, but acknowledging that had that been a black dude, you know, having that confrontation with a cop, it would have been a very different outcome. And I think, I think, I agree. And I think the people that um, can watch the news and see black and brown people being killed for traffic violations, and then play back that story I just told you you, you got it. We got to see that difference. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I'm I'm really lucky to be a part of this Tuesday night group called White Men for Racial Justice, and it's like a hundred dudes that jump I you on. Weren't supposed to talk about. The well, I'm going to mention it, but then move on. <laughs> and um, the reason I brought it up is because every Wednesday morning, then I go to November Project, and so like I'm kind of waking up fresh off of this mm-hmm. this last conversation before I went to bed, before I yeah. got back with the community in November Project. Um, and one of the conversations about this this groundwater theory and like how Racism is in everything. And, and I think when people wanna solve things quickly and figure out how to make things right overnight, you come to this like barrier of frustration. And I, and, and I, think, I think that's, that's like the, um, that's the first reaction of like, how are we gonna fix this? How are we gonna fix November Project? You know, can November Project dismantle white supremacy? And, and, and you laugh, but it's like, uh, I think that dismantling white supremacy happens in small spaces times a million, right? Uh-huh. And so if we can make small changes with the location that we host a workout, what does it mean to choose something in Dallas or in Orlando or in London that's quote unquote centrally located? Like, what does that mean? Mm. Centrally by whose definition, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, social media is such a toxic place right now, but. I saw something that I thought was really great, which is like this idea of, um, there's a big difference. The, the line was, there's a big difference between um, all are welcome 
and this was built with you in mind. Mm. And um, I just thought it was super powerful. Like we were guilt tripping half the city of like, oh, you can get there, get there. But we were really just talking to white folks we were connected to. Yeah, there seems to be this tension between, or this internal tension uh, with white people. On the one hand, this desire to participate in the solution, but also a cautiousness like, is this really my place? This is this, you know, is it appropriate for me to participate in this, or is that like going to come across as you know, or come across in the wrong way, frankly? And I think that creates a lot of paralysis. Participate in this meaning in in you know in, in the progressive movement towards change. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's funny. It's funny you say that. I I um I always looked at. Uh, friends of mine or co-leaders uh, who I would consider activists, especially w- white folks that I saw wearing BLM clothing. Mm-hmm. And I always like thought that they were, they'd done all the reading and that they were like, they were in it and they were like, must've been experts or like, you know, they, they, had, they had voted the right way and, and given their money there and mm-hmm. were a mentor and, and also knew all the policies and they're, they're really fighting the fight every minute of every day and they've been at it for years. and. Um, and this idea of starting somewhere, like um, one of our leaders in, um, in Kansas City, Nicole, I really admire her. She's like just always boots on the ground, always having these conversations, always uh, challenging white folks in her life and having conversations like, um, but she's always wearing PLM gear. And I always looked at her and like, I admired her. And it was almost like she's on the varsity team. Like she's, she's an anti-racist, but I, I got to read a couple more books or like, I'm not there yet. And um, I've had friends in my life recently just be like, no, you have to, you have to, you have to start. If it's signaling with a yard sign, mm-hmm. if it's a hooded sweatshirt, if it's donating, if it's uh, the training that you're doing with November Project co-leaders, um, you know, just continue in education, but then you have to go out and have these conversations. You have to go out and participate and build meaningful relationships. And, um, so anyway, I, I just, I, I, find, I find the um, the bummer of a challenge is getting folks to take a step, to mm-hmm. start something, you mm-hmm. know? And it was so easy for me to talk about that when I was talking about fitness, right? And it was so easy for us to figure out diversity and how to bring different kinds of athletes along, right? Like that was a really an easy one for us to talk about. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of people, especially white people freeze up when it comes to like, I don't know where to begin. Mm-hmm. And and what about uh, what about the person who doesn't want to begin? Like you must have people in your life who really don't want to engage with this. Certainly not at the level that you've that you've been engaging with it. Yeah. Um. Th- so uh, I'll give you my answer. For for me, for me, I I've always said, and I said this to you back when we met years ago, which is like. I give people a lot of a lot of chances, and and how that shows up in these conversations is that I'll meet someone where they are, you know, I'll have a whatever pace conversation you need to have. Uh, I'll politely try and debunk and explain and understand where your positioning is, and and uh, and meet people wherever they are on the road, mm-hmm. right? If someone says there is no problem, if someone says race isn't a thing. I think that's really a hard place to start, right? But um, you know, one of the six community agreements for November Project is this idea of calling people in, and um, it sounds so like gentle and a little bit hippie of like, don't call people out, Rich. That's too messy. Mm-hmm. Call them in. But it, there really is some truth to it, which is like, if you call someone out and say, "Well, that sounds racist. I think you're racist." Like, how much could you even repair that well, yeah, relationship just, conversation? You like, know, ended any opportunity yeah. for and, moving the needle, so and the, you've destroyed your relationship with that person right. in the meantime. And so to to learn more, to learn more, to ask more questions, and 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 understand where they're coming from. I mean, that process takes a long time, and it yeah. takes patience. And, and and if someone were to say, I'm not here for that. I'm cutting that person out of my life. Um, I also understand that for them. Yeah. But I, I recognize sometimes with, with white people in my life, I can make change by saying, tell me more about that. 
Is that really how you feel? Have you thought that through or is that just kind of the people around you for much of your life? Like, where mm -hmm. does this come from? Like, mm -hmm. um, and I think tone is a tough thing, right? Because we can come off pretty judgmental with just the wrong <laughs> kind of angle. Yeah, or the tone's wrong... hard enough in person. Forget right. about it on social media. It goes right. nowhere fast. So, but it's so interesting that you. So you, you know, we went into the whole November project origin story the first time that we sat down, and people should listen to that podcast. I love that conversation. Um, so we don't need to retrace all of that. But it starts in Boston. You end up moving to San Diego and continue to build November Project. And then how many years ago did you move to Minneapolis? Three years ago? Um, so we moved here uh, July, July, August of 2019, uh -huh. so a year and a half. Yeah. And now with everything that's transpiring in the city, making it literally ground zero for the civil rights movement, right? right um, provide you with a lens into you know, a level of truth that perhaps you wouldn't have been exposed to. And in turn, that gives you a depth of experience that you can inject into November Project to really make it a leader in this kind of new evolution of community fitness. I, I would like to think so. I'd like to think mm -hmm. so. I, I like it's like almost divine. It was like it was almost like meant to be, right? Like it's weird. It it, it is weird that, and to go back, like so so uh, very happy in San Diego. We were married in La Jolla. Um, we moved there January 1st of 2015, fell in love with the surf culture, fell in love with the people. Goldie's, my wife's sister lives there in Pacific Beach. And um, and we had a little baby, everything was, we're kind of living that renter's life, like kind of pretending like we could live in nice mm -hmm. neighborhoods, but he just didn't have like a long-term plan. And what if we're gonna have a second kid? I don't know how that's gonna go. What if we wanted to buy a house? And so meanwhile, like, November projects free. I'm always right. like, how's this dude like pays bills? Like, right. how does this work? Right. You know? You wanna to get to that? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so we, I left my job, I, I was in marketing for a couple uh -huh. of years. Uh, I worked for the performance running team at New Balance in I think 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. Before that I had some other like active lifestyle marketing jobs. Um, and we signed a partnership with the North Face, which was strong for half a decade. Um, and that partnership fuels our leadership gatherings and mm. put outdoor training gear on all of our leaders. And it gave us the ability to quit our jobs and not only work on November project full-time, but also um, build some of their community ideas around train. And and, um, and then so at the end of 18, we were in conversations with Brooks running, our contract was up with the North Face and um, a Seattle based run company, you know, the, mm -hmm. the name in running. And so, um, that quickly changed kind of the way we talked about playing outside with all this winter gear with the North yeah. Face to like, no, run happy, be in the run, enjoy your run. And and um, and that relationship now is is two years strong. And yeah. so so that so the partnership piece keeps November Project as far as the um you know the, the investment of keeping yeah, the organization you, going. It's, yeah, it's yeah. cool. It's cool that a brand can get on board with that and they yeah. understand the value proposition. Yeah. because the community is so strong. And, and and not for nothing, shout out to Des Linden, Brooks athlete, yesterday. broke the 50K world record, crushed it by like seven minutes yesterday. Des went under three hours for 50K to do the new world record for 50, 50K of running. Mm -hmm. And uh, 50K of running for those is 31 miles. I've done 50K a couple of times. It took me like a million hours. Right. And, and my fastest road marathon is three minutes slower uh -huh. than Des. She held five forty sevens. But Des is um. Did you did you see any clips? I mean, were you paying no, attention I to mean, Josh? I was just I was watching Josh's Twitter feed. Right. And we follow. I mean, we were en route to the airport and all of that, like right. trying to get here. So I, I, you know, there was no live stream of it anyway. It was just a Twitter thing. But yeah. it was cool to see. Um, the letter, the level of Twitter involvement, like the the whole internet was like all about the whole running internet was like all about this. Yep. And everybody jumped on board to like celebrate this, which was really an event. It's a COVID event. Like she kind of they they mapped out this course. Yeah. And just kind of did it. Yep. You know, it wasn't like a scheduled race or anything like that. It was so awesome. We had but everybody was watching it. It was so awesome. We had our, our weekly Brooks call today and we were talking about it with Lauren and Brian and Boyan and myself, the four of us are on a call every week. And, and um, we were just talking about kind of that, that like 
the, the attitude of just kind of doing it. Like it was like, in some ways it was like real, real running. Like right. a, it's been a while since we've all and like- there, there, there's kind of a uh, November project flair to that, right? Like we don't need all this other stuff. Like so, here's the road. So cool. And like the finish line was like held up by Josh right. and another yeah, person. It was like, Josh. it was world Shout record. Out to Josh Cox. Josh Cox, San Diego Padres um, team manager. Big Padres fan. Yeah, so um, yeah, and, and um, let's see, we have another partnership with uh, an eyewear company in San Diego. Um, oh, oh, but Des, Des has come through a, a handful of times. I've run into Des in mm-hmm. San Diego and, um, and uh, Des also led one of our leadership only runs in Seattle when we brought everyone together in 2019 at the, we call it the meeting of the minds. Um, and so I know that a lot of November project, especially the leaders were watching yesterday. So shout out Des, cool. you're amazing. It's cool. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Um, it's it's it, it it must be uh, challenging for you. We're switching gears a little bit here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's introverts, there's extroverts, and then there's extreme extroverts. Yeah, I would put you on the far end of that yeah. spectrum of extreme extrovert, gifted public speaker, somebody who you know wasn't afraid to get on a plane, totally, and totally. get up on a stage, totally. and get a bunch of people excited, totally. and to show up at whatever hour of the day at a November project thing yep. to get everybody fired up. Yeah. And now, boom, pandemic, yep. all out the window. Yeah. And you've, you've had to like sit with your, I mean, that's like an extrovert's worst nightmare. It's the worst. You might have to look you in the love mirror. It. You might have to look in the <laughs> mirror and like, do a little self inventory. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was laughing at you and Honnell talking about this because uh-huh. you guys were like, "Yeah, it's great. It's fine. We don't have yeah. to go anywhere." And I was like, <laughs> "These guys are idiots." <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, you know, I um, I do not love the social distancing. I uh-huh. do not love the masks. I don't love it. I don't love any of this stuff. And um, you know, I think early on in the pandemic, we all had to like say. I don't know if you remember this, but like back when we thought it was weeks, remember like it was like mm-hmm. seven weeks or like maybe maybe 14 weeks or whatever, people would be like, oh, I'm getting tired of this. And But you always had to say like, but I don't have it that bad. It was always you had like precursor or like mm-hmm. kind of followed up with like, I'm doing fine. I don't really have anything to complain about, but here's how I'm actually feeling. And then the longer the pandemic went, people started hopefully more often, but I definitely in my community, just sharing, yeah. you know, the drain, it, the, how draining it is. and. Um, I mean, for, for I, have, I have my November project answer and I have my personal answer. My personal answer is like, I, I realized during COVID that those little conversations that I thought I was having, you know, kind of engaging with the, 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 the postal worker or the barista, like mm-hmm. I thought I was like mid, Midwest nice, like polite, like I thought I was doing it for them. And I, once you turned it off, I recognized like, that's also how I right. plug in. That's your fuel. Right. And so, you know, you mentioned public speaking, like, I don't lead workouts anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I help the organization of November Project, which leads workouts all over the world. And so that thrill of stepping up on a Wednesday morning and then, or even interacting on the community level, like with the folks, I, the people I see on my block, like it was mm-hmm. all just brought to nothing. And so 
I was surprised at how tough it was. I thought I could like, I thought I could like, um, like be just optimistic and just like stay positive. Uh-huh. And it, it got tough, it got draining, yeah. you know? Um, you know, I, to, to go. I'm on, not surprised. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I would have, du- I would have duly expected that you would have a harder go than most people. Yeah, because you're not out. Everyone tunneled, says that. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, and it, like you know, um, my my sister in law Zoe said one time when I got back from a trip, she she kind of called me out. Like she kind of pulled me aside. She lives in San Diego, and she goes, "Man, I, I think you're having even more fun on the road than you let on." Mm-hmm. And not like shady, but just like I, she was basically referencing like I would come back from these adventures, and I would kind of like play like dad role or husband role and be like, let's go out to dinner and let's just kind of be a little bit more domesticated and kind of indoor voice and that's fine. Because I just had a screaming, wild, community driven, like togetherness, like recess, gym class, the social structure all in one, like the fire hose for three days in two cities. And like- You got it, you you, you had that outlet. Right. And so- You got fed. So you right. can come home and be present right. and not, you know. And so be- like, you know, even last year, like the Meeting of the Minds and November Project Summit were virtual events. You know, it's like, okay. And you and I have talked about this in the mm-hmm. past, like how much can you lean into that Zoom? Like how much can you, everyone's on mute. You yeah. know, like how vibey can you get, right? And I love the challenge, but it's like, what's an A plus like togetherness vibe? What does that look and feel like on Zoom? Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's. I mean, it doesn't compare to your worst, lamest November project right. experience. But just, just also for context, like you, you don't even like you don't even like to text or do phone calls. Like it's all visual. Like you're either <laughs> it's either FaceTime or uh, leaving a video message. Of course, by all text. Rich, rich, they're called short right. films. We've gone over this. They're called <laughs> short films because they're thoughtful yes. and maybe you're artistic. Like, send me a short film, and you've bought in. <laughs> Now has I has have. that affected? Have you sent? Or am I your only short film guy? Um, or are you? No, I started doing it more see? actually. So there's there's yeah there's been you've 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 impacted me in that regard. Uh, and it see? is it is better. It's better. Yeah. And then you can get to like the the idea of like sneaking into. Oh, by the way, I wrote you a letter. You did. I, so I'm, I'm a letter I writer. And this. I didn't know whether I was supposed to. You can open it. Here. I don't even know. What, oh, it's artwork. I made wow. some artwork. Right. It's a shark. Oh the, my god! You use a typewriter. There you go. Hipster points. Hipster points. Now, and the reason I'm the reason I'm telling you that it's similar to the short film, man. It's like this. In, Rogan, quote BG unquote Graham. Then you have your phone number and yeah. your address. You can file that away. <laughs> the, 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 I love it. The man. reason that that the, the reason the that fits with the short film is that during the pandemic we spend so much time on screens. How can I sneak into Rich's day? How can I drop a video to Keith Kelly in Utah and? But, and when he needs the vibe, when it fits, right? Uh-huh. Cause we've all had that person calling you during the pandemic that you've, you haven't caught up with them for a while. I, Phone's I, heavy. I, can't, I can't rev another rev, even for someone I love right now, I should probably give them an hour, it's been a while. And then you miss the call and it's kind of like, whew. and that's for people, that's for people that you like, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So sneaking in. So if you're listening to this and you're a letter writer or you used to be, get back into it or send a video to your friend by way of text. Yeah, because then sneak. that way they get to see you, they hear your vibe, but right. there's no implicit obligation that you have to get back to them right away. Right. Um, I like that. Yeah, so short films, what else, vibey. Um, I, I, um, I think last year was, uh, this is kind of more the November Project answer, but you know, when the NBA <laughs> canceled, uh-huh. they put their statement out. Um, we canceled like within 24 hours. Yeah, that was the day. That was, that was the day. Like, that was like the Rubicon, right? No like one could that wait was, around. That was the day where everything shut down. Yeah. We're like, oh wow, <clears throat> this is like real. And growing up as a hoops fan, I liked that the world was waiting. What's the NBA gonna do? Okay, they're canceled. Okay, shut mm-hmm. it all down. Um, but we in all 52 cities shut down at the same time. And um, and as a group that's never canceled for weather ever, like, or, you know, um, the only other time we canceled a workout was for the manhunt the Friday after the marathon bombing mm, in Boston right. in 2013. And so it just felt really weird to be like, shut it down, you know? And we recognize that our leaders might need uh, a little bit of a breather. I don't wanna say break, cause that doesn't really like jive. These, these mm-hmm. folks are just as vibey. Um, 
and we shouldn't have been surprised, but all these leaders stepped up and they got their Zoom going and they started hosting virtual stuff. And um, it was, I think it even seemed a little fun early on, you know? But as those weeks turned into months and it was just like, oh, this is, oh, this is just how we do it now. Mm -hmm. um, the workout that you went to in West LA um, years ago, you experienced, right? They kind of come together, a, a normal-ish in-person November Project experiences. There's a crowd of people somewhere, you go in, Oftentimes the new people get introduced. Um, the leaders say what the workout's gonna be. And within a few minutes, you're moving. And the block of time could be 20, 30 minutes, but it's usually your, the full mm -hmm. experience. You're back in your car, back on your bike within an hour. And then the reason I'm kind of framing that up is that now in this Zoom era, these leaders, instead of just saying, oh, you're gonna run up the stairs, ready, go. And then just taking pictures and doing a couple flights here and there. like they are truly fitness experience hosts, 45 minutes mm -hmm. nonsense. It's almost like stand-up comedy of like- Yeah, you gotta be like trying a to, Peloton instructor. Yeah, you're trying to fill it. And so the vast majority of our November Project co-leaders are not fitness professionals. And so it, it was a lot of growth and it's mm. pretty draining. And so- And how long did it go on in the virtual realm? Cause you did one this morning. So you guys are back at least in some cities. Certain cities are back. Um, you know, it's gonna be a longer road for, for some than others, you know. Um, Toulouse, which is a, the, the one November project that we have in France, in Southern France is, um, you know, they've got a pretty long road in front of them yeah. uh, before coming back in person. Um, here in Minneapolis, they've been back for, I think six weeks, maybe something like that. And they, but they're doing it differently. So it's not like what you experience where there's a hundred people, it's um, small groups in three locations. So now they're covering more ground. Uh -huh. They have three leaders, which is, that's normal. Um, it's capped, so it's a sign-up sheet, which is on their Instagram, and there's a spreadsheet. You have to sign the waiver, mm, which that's people. really at odds with the whole spirit. Of just the whole show thing. up right yeah. now. It's like just showed up, but like kind of changing. Let's see what we got here. Your garments oh, cool. going. I got off. it. I should look into the whoop. The whoop don't <laughs> yeah, make those sounds. Is your heart rate off yeah. the chain I'm fine. right now? It right? seems like I'm excited. Okay. No. So so all right. So um, yeah. So 20 people per per location. These three leaders, um, Emily, E. Rolf, and Sarah, they split up, and. Going back to what we talked about, like centralized location, they're able to try things, like which mm -hmm. spreadsheets fill up first. And the extra digital step for such an OG, like is kind of killing me. Cause it's like, that, that, that doesn't fit the just show up, but this is how you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Masks before, during and after. Um, and like a, a, a ready set go plan for if someone gets COVID, yeah. what happens? What does contact tracing look like? What do group photos look like? I mean, you remember with Maggie yeah. and Tara in West LA, it was like- I mean, there like, must have been 150 people yeah, there. for sure. And it was like, squeeze closer. Okay, now everyone lean yeah. on there. It was like very much like human contact yeah. times 100. And now yeah. it's like, so, so it feels different, but man, if you've spent 10, 12 months not doing group things, mm -hmm. it feels so good to be back. Have you had so a be situation back. where somebody tested positive and you mm -hmm. had to do a contract contact tracing deal and yep. figure out how to respond? Yes. Wow. Yes. And in those moments, I was very proud of the efficiency. I know that sounds like a managerial thing uh -huh. to say, but like, I would, cause, because my because I reacted You're like- You're a human resources professional. I, no, I reacted, I was like, oh man, we're in trouble. We are, oh uh -huh. man, we're fucked. It's gonna, oh, this is gonna be a disaster. And then like the leaders here in the Twin Cities were like, no, we reached out to the 10 people and we followed the list of names from the waivers and we reached out to them and let them know within a day, mm. the, the state of Minnesota considered it, um, it didn't qualify as a close contact because it was outside social distancing with math, data. like they were just on it. And mm. so we let them know that they should go get tested if they're interested and if they don't, if they, it was just like, yeah, it, they kind of did it, I don't wanna say perfectly, but nearly perfectly right mm. away. I mean, so that's the model we're looking at, you know, and and, Look, I, I think with November Project, for those of us who remember those groups of a couple hundred people, Boston gets, you know, four or 500 people. Same with Edmonton. It's like, I think rather than holding on and being like, I can't wait to get back there, just be like, no, no, no. Because we continue to change, like we're not going back. Yeah. You're not going back to sweaty hugs. Yeah. Maybe ever, right? And so- Well, I think that's, that, that is, you know, an important idea, not just in the context of, of November project, but broadly, whether it's what's going on, you know, in this city and how the world is paying attention to it or how we're just interacting with each other and our professional lives. Like, right. we're, I think we need to, 
if we haven't already, disabuse ourselves of this idea of getting back to the way it was. We're not right. going back to the way it was. We're going back to, towards something different, hopefully something better. Right. But it feels like every facet of our lives is sort of being impacted by that idea. Yeah. And what that's gonna look like. And it's all up in the air. Yeah, I mean, the, the really positive, like, let's look at the brighter side, Rich side of November Project during the pandemic was that you could argue it was the easiest time to join. You can mm -hmm. do it from your living room, right? And so if you here in the Twin Cities wanna wake up and do the Zoom with Emily and Rob in New York City, you just gotta get up a little bit earlier. You can play the mm -hmm. time zone game and mm -hmm. start with London at two in the morning on Tuesday night. You know, I've done workouts with uh, November Project M Miri, which is in Malaysia. It's just, Small fishing town in Malaysia. On Tuesday, like I think it's at two p.m. on Tuesday. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So it's like the the idea of like being able to easier having an easier route to drop in on other communities and get to know people. Like it's a stretch, especially for someone. I just finished yeah. saying how much I like interact with no, people. No, I but, get like, it. I mean, there's something listen, there. It's you know? cool and it's not the same. Like right. I just know this in the context of of like twelve step meetings. You know, it's right. like I that's you know a, a different version. Uh, of what you're talking about that gives me sustenance and fuel and you know a sense of purpose and direction and groundedness and and all the like and when it all goes to zoom yeah I do it but it's not the same and I do feel myself wanting it to go back to the way it was right. and you know look at some point we'll all gather you right. know, together the way that we do that is probably going to be different right but the challenge is getting over that um refusal to engage now because you're waiting until right. that later moment because you're missing the opportunity in the interim. Yeah. By the way, how often do you go? Depends. I, I mean, the, is that a personal the, question? The truth Probably is, personal question. yeah, no, it's it's personal. I'm happy to answer it. I mean, the truth is that that my meeting attendance dropped off dramatically, you know, because it's on right. Zoom. And I was like, I just can't do another Zoom call, man. Right. You know? And recently I found my way back to it yeah, and yeah. falling in love with it in a different kind of way yep. because I was just waiting for it to go back to the way that it was. And it's, a, you know, it's the most important aspect of my life. Yeah. And yet I couldn't get myself to log on because <sighs> I, was just, I just had Zoom fatigue and I just didn't wanna do it. Well, in that, yeah. The thing, the add, another, add another hour looking at screens, mm -hmm. you know. We had a uh, meeting with the board of directors for November Project, and one of the, one of the uh, board members who was who was newer to the community said, "You know, who are some of your uh, competitors?" And I, the, the joke and the reality is like warm warm beds in the uh -huh. morning, right? Because we're a morning only yeah. group, right? And when people are getting up and putting their shoes on and going to have an outdoor experience, as opposed to opening the lid of a laptop solo in a quiet apartment, like it's just a, it's such a wildly different thing, and. Um, yeah, I mean, look. But I, I would I, suspect that you 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 are competing with the Pelotons of the world, like because everyone's at home and trying to find a workout at home. You're free, and you're an all comer deal, but without the the group congregation aspect of it, right. now you're relegated to competing with everybody else who's doing fitness online. I want I want to use this platform, and I'm glad you came here just to let Peloton know we're going to bring them down. <laughs> If, you, if you're listening, Peloton, you're going down. Robin wow. NYC, you're going down. <laughs> Robin, you're going down. No, I mean, you know, like, and, and that's the tough thing, like what you said about the meetings and waiting waiting for them to go back, right? You know, running running into into people or, or connecting with people over, you know, online, social, whatever, and, be, and have someone say, you know, I'm just waiting until they're back. Yeah. I'm just not doing Zoom. Like you almost understand it. Like the way I would speak to someone on the street years ago, I'd be like, dude, you got this. And I would chop down all their excuses. And now I just, we just have to be, people have to be more gentle to each mm -hmm. other. Our leaders in Atlanta are like, we're not gonna be pushy recruiters. If we get five people who wanna be there, that's great. If we get 15, great. But we're not gonna guilt a 16th person into showing up to a Zoom experience mm -hmm. in the morning, not knowing all that's pushing and pulling them in yeah. their day, you know? So that's something. How many cities are you doing it in person now? Uh, I think uh, 15 or 20. Yeah. And, and, and the reason I give you that kind of hazy answer is in, 
So it's not even just a, a lever of Zoom or in person. There's there's different challenges. There's what's called flybys where they'll kind of assign different locations and like a kind of a less centralized hosted thing. And mm-hmm. so, um, but full full swing back with a big group, like pretty much not none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Well, we're in this weird in between zone right now where we feel like we're emerging out of right. this situation, but we really haven't quite yet. Nope. And we're all impulse to like, just say, come on, let's just get on with life, right? right? And, 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 and I also think it's funny like this And time. now like Minnesota's having a little bit of a spike as a result of that. I mean, California's doing really well right now, but. Yeah. And then someone says something about variants. Let's also, let's just use all yeah, the buzzwords. Yeah. Uh, booster shots, what else <laughs> do we say? Um, yeah, I mean, the, um, the just this idea of like springtime here in the Midwest, like it feel like I, I have to check myself a little bit and be like, just because it feels like we should be back, that means nothing, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, that, have you had any like days in the seventies yet? Like that first day mm-hmm. where it's a blue sky mm-hmm. and it's like seventy four degrees out. Mm-hmm. And Midwestern folks are <laughs> stoked, yeah. just pasty white legs, uh-huh. just like Minnesota. It's it's wild, and um, and yeah, like when I left San Diego, like it was one thing. Like we didn't, no one ever talked about the weather in San Diego, right? And there's and nothing to, there's talk, nothing to about. talk about, right? And and um, and there is this gritty nature of of looking forward to and surviving a winter. The Nordic ski scene and and the fat tire scene, things that people, for ice fishing, which no, I haven't gotten into yet. I don't think I'm going to, uh-huh. but um, I had a knee surgery this past winter and I, I've spent a lot of time on snowshoes walking around and talking to those people out there in the huts. You know, there's something, there's like, something that comes to I life. I need to talk to people. I'm gonna put <laughs> snowshoes it's gotten on. So I'm bad. so desperate. <laughs> to it's talk gotten- to somebody. I'm gonna walk out on this frozen lake and knock on this hut. <laughs> Well, and I use the same line. So these are these are usually usually men, uh, usually kind of standoffish at first. And here's my mm-hmm. approach, because I've lived here for a year and a half. My approach is, <laughs> I've done this, I've never admitted this. I've done this probably 30 times. 30 different ice huts. Uh, Lake Minnetonka, I live kind of near there. H- hello, uh, hi, yeah, is this ice fishing? I just moved, yeah. Hi, I just moved here from Southern California. I kind of just like give them the whole story. And then they'll usually show me the whole thing. Uh huh. This is how we drill the thing. And I know how they drill it. Right. I met a guy last week, so I, but I keep that going. So I'm gonna play the new guy card for like, I'm gonna play the new guy. I might play it for 10 years. You would have to pay me a lot of money to do that. I would just never, it would never occur to me to do that. And I thought it was a drinking thing. I always thought it was like some Homer Simpson, like Al uh-huh. Bundy, like I was gonna ask, from, like, like usually sit out there. Like, and, those guys are a couple pops in. I thought that, I thought it was like mostly about the cooler of beers and maybe a radio. And I was so wrong. These are like sport fisher people, fishermen. Mm. So there, anyway, I was wrong about that. I was actually looking for like somebody to be like, you want a beer? Cause I just thought that'd be cool to have that experience. Yeah. Yes, I do. You know, <laughs> are we friends yet? <laughs> one, of my, one of my buddies in San Diego calls me a friend hunter. He just, he says that I'm always, <laughs> I'm always looking for what like- What does Goldie think about that? The friend hunter? Just like the whole vibe, the, the like general go, when you go out in public, and she has to contend with the guy who's literally going to walk up to every stranger. Um, I think she liked it when we were falling in love. I think it's a lot. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. I'm not. I don't do low key really well. So it's well, like you're not like on a on a, a trajectory towards a destination. There's a lot of stops along oh, the way. Oh yeah, right? it's like, no. So it's, getting from A to B. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a, it's like a multi dimensional kind of experience of like evolving. let's go over there for a while, no reason. <laughs> I don't know, you know. Um, but but it's um, but it's the reason that I think I have these really weird interesting kind of occurrences. Mm-hmm. And and I, and I know that, I don't know, what's the Larry Bird thing? You miss all the shots, you don't take something, you yeah. don't take. And so, so for me, when it comes to people, it's like, and I had this happen just this past summer and it was towards the end of last summer. Um, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna tell this story. I, my knee was still kind of something, my bike was in the shop, it wasn't happening. So I ended up rollerblading, okay? Imagine me on uh-huh. rollerblades, I can skate. Okay, I rollerblading through downtown Minneapolis and now you see what it's like. And um, in my past rowing life, I got really good at checking out rowers on the Charles River because I was a coach after I was an athlete. And I would watch the way men and women would take strokes, boom, 
boom, and the body positioning and the shape and their build and even sitting down, but that's a tall person. That seems like, oh, they could probably relax their upper body. I was scouting athletes and bodies. And so um, it's never really left me. And then how we've fallen into running essentially, um, I'm still checking out runners, mm -hmm. you know? So last, last summer I was in uh, rollerblading through downtown Minneapolis, which was a ghost town as, as it is. Yeah. And I saw this guy who was just such a smooth, smooth runner. So smooth, like you could put a glass of water on top of his head kind of thing. And I admire that because I'm a big heavy runner, mm -hmm. right? And my first reaction, because it was like 9 a.m. or something, it was like just after or just before nine. And I'm thinking, I'm kind of like doing the math. I'm like, so okay, this guy's running in downtown. That seems kind of like a touristy thing to do. He's a really good runner, long dreadlocks, black man, looked like he was between 20 and 40. So it's like, I'm like, okay, friend hunter. Okay, this is great. And then I'm like, and I stop myself. I'm like, okay, Goldie says I talk to people too much. Okay. And then I'm not just trying to talk to a black guy. Okay, but I should, but you shouldn't, don't go just trying to be friends. Hang on. And I'm like, I'm playing all this. And I'm like, okay. And I kept skating, I skated past him. And I was like, oh, I've, I've become someone defied else. defied your nature. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't proud. Uh -huh. And so like a block later, I was like, <laughs> and this is all going on in my head. A block later, I was like, no, that's not who you are. This, that's, you don't have a ton of skills. Maybe one of them is approach. Maybe mm -hmm. that is one. And this guy's gonna think you're an idiot and it's not, he, you're not gonna connect, but you don't know unless you try. So I pretended that my rollerblade was like messed up. So I waited at a crosswalk uh -huh. and this dude rolls up. You need to create all this artifice. Totally. Because you've already passed him. Because totally. you couldn't loop back around. Can't that would loop be back. weird. Yeah. And, he, and he's standing there and I go, hey, look, man, I um, noticed that you are an extremely smooth runner. And, I, and I've got a running injury right now, but if I were running, all these buildings would be shaking and you would know it. You got a big laugh, right? Skate with the guy for a little bit <clears throat> from Kansas City, visiting. He's here to work, very kind of just general. And I said, Kansas City, we have a November project there. They meet at the War Memorial on Wednesday mornings. You should go. You're a runner. Mm -hmm. You're up in the morning-ish. Started talking, talking, whatever. We started following each other on social. And it uh, turns out he's a journalist for the New York Times. And he covers race and culture. His name's John Elligan. Mm -hmm. Shout out, John. Um, and I think he thinks I'm a maniac. Um, he's the guy who's been covering he's everything the guy that's been, been going covering. on here for the New York Times. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah. Um, Trinidadian, Trinid, Trinid, Trinidadian. I've never tried to say that one, but we gotta try it. We gotta practice stuff, Rich, mm -hmm. out in the open, <laughs> right. public record. He's Trinidadian. Uh, I probably butchered that one. Uh, super, super calm guy, uh, lifetime runner. Um, obviously he's an incredible writer. Uh, and he, <laughs> someone from the New York Times recently said that he's so dedicated to his work, he pretty much moved to Minneapolis, yeah. which, which is accurate to that story. Well, if this is his beat, he's gotta be here, right? And so then the, the only other, part of the story where John Elligan and I overlap. And now I think we are friends. And John, if we're not, just text me and you can just tell me, I'll shut it down. But um, he was in town to do an interview with the mayor and, um, and Jacob Fry hit me up and he said, hey, look, I've got the New York Times in the morning. I hadn't talked to this John Elligan guy. I had completely out of my mind. I had the New York Times in the morning, so I should probably go with him solo. And I said, okay, you're the mayor, dude, whatever. Uh -huh. And, it and was, you didn't tell. I had no you didn't idea. Tell Jacob this story. He of didn't course know the not. Story. I, uh -huh. That's a, just right. a kind of a normal story. Anyway, he meets up with some New York Times guy. It happens to be this guy. In the first twenty steps of the run, John Elegan says to Jacob, "Do you know? Do you know Broken Graham?" And they both cracked up, and it was like this great experience. And so the reason I'm telling that story is not to celebrity brag on John or Jacob or you on the Rich yeah. Roll podcast. It but is you a forgot story. What, you forgot what Jacob said, which was, I blew off Brogan to go right. running with totally, you. Today. Totally. Yeah. So, so the story is this. You got to you gotta go in. You got to like go that. in. Yeah. You got to go in. Especially now living in the Midwest, being so close to Madison, where I'm from. My brother lives in Milwaukee. Like, it's starting to be kind of like, it's starting to be kind of, where did you go to high school kind of vibe, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been living in different coasts for the last 20 years. And so it's a, it's a cool time. And I'm, I, I think the masks and the social distancing and the, the uh, intensity that we're feeling right now, to me, it just feels like restrictions and challenges of like, okay. Yeah. Well, how did you become friends and running buddies with the mayor? Yeah. Um, so when I lived in Boston and San Diego, um, a very dear friend of ours, a very dedicated November project 
run, true runner um, who actually got me connected to New Balance back in the day, Claire Wood, um, now lives in Portland, Oregon, went to high school with Jacob. Mm. Um, and so when we moved here, she was like, you should connect with this guy. <laughs> and I didn't really know, I mean, I didn't really know anybody. Uh-huh. So, um, he's a former pro runner. Yeah, I mean, he's a 216 marathon. 216. He got like fourth at the Pan Am Games or yeah. something like that, competed internationally for yeah. the US. He has to be the fastest, the most accomplished runner in elected office in the US. Yeah, and then and then also just like a, another running fun fact, like a local, um, the mayor in St. Paul is also a former pro runner. Really? Like a sprinter, wow. yeah. And so so anyway, um, but uh, I, you know, this, these twin cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, in my experience, and growing up in a big college town, the capital of Wisconsin in Madison, um, going to school in Boston, being around a lot of educated folks, living next to Harvard and MIT, that whole zone. And then San Diego's got a lot of, a lot of great things about different. it, but it's not exactly yeah. a, like a, you know. An um, intellectual hotbed. It's not where people, it's not where Goodwill Hunting was filmed in San Diego. <laughs> um, but uh, moving here, it, it, in my experience, it feels like the baseline level of local politics and activism and understanding of like mm-hmm. th- those worlds, it, it's, in my opinion, it's fairly high. And so I think Jacob and I hit it off because we both like to run in the morning. Um, I didn't know very many people. And then when he would talk about work, I would be like, I don't love you, man, but I don't really, I don't know what the heck you're talking. I don't mm-hmm. care. I don't like, I care a little bit, but like not really. And I think he's, he's got a world full of people here that um, he's got a lot of demands, you know? But I would suspect that after living here for a while, you don't really have the, the latitude to not care. Like you quickly become somebody who cares. And you seem like somebody who does care. I mean, not about the intricacies of, of you know, wonky policy making, but just in terms of how local politics has a very real impact on yep. the people that live here and what that means because of what's happening here to the rest of the world. Like it's very significant what's going on right now. Yeah, and I would say that I, since the last year and a half of being here, I'm engaged. I think I understand what's going on um, on a local level, but the the people within reach in my, in my life here in the Twin mm-hmm. Cities are kind of more toward the activism level mm-hmm. of, right. of what feels like unhappy no matter what happens sometimes. And so that's hard. Yeah. Like I think we should all wake up and do our part. Um, and and there's just always there's always going to be more work in any topic in any uh-huh. in any part of this. You know. I can't imagine the the pressure that that Jacob Fry feels right now to try to keep things intact. It's got to be unbelievable. Yeah. Well, you'll talk to him. And man. the extent to which running helps him like process all of it. I yeah. Would, I would imagine. I mean, uh, he speaks on running um, the way a lot of folks in, in the November Project community speak on running where it's like, if you miss your run and you get that extra 90 minutes of sleep or an hour of sleep, like it doesn't do as much for your day as had you traded that sleep Gotten for the experience, right? The run. And so, yeah, he's, he runs crazy hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should say he, his, his day is a long day that starts early. and. Um, yeah, I just admire, I admire people that are up out of bed doing something physical before they go into whatever their role yeah. is in any community, you know? And so, I don't know, it takes, takes a lot of criticism, a lot of shots from a lot of people, Yeah, but like, you know, you don't a lot see- of, There's a lot of vitriol and a lot of love, like it's split, right? Like a lot of people don't like the guy and a mm-hmm. lot of people are on board with him and he's mm-hmm. at the intersection and kind of the, um, you know, he's the he's the sort of, vehicle through which a lot of people can process whatever they're unhappy with about how things are going down right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean and and um you know, he's a, he's a he's a handsome, you know, really fast runner that like kind of, you know, if people don't like him, they they find a way to really not liking him, you know? Mm-hmm. And um he's a white man and um he's also this is a key piece not from here. Right. Right. And I think in a lot of cities, especially for the position of mayor, that matters from a lot. Texas, where's he from? Uh, he's from Virginia. Okay. Where Claire and he went to, yeah, so. 
So yeah, and it's it's a re-election year, so right. But now I live in the burbs, so I can't really even vote. So good luck, Jacob. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Burb. Speaking um, of uh, you know getting up and getting the run in, so that the rest of your day goes well. That's something I did today. I can't say I got up all that early. I wasn't. Do you want a time stamp? It? I was not going to make give it the Pacific November Standard. project. It's it is two hours later here. So what time and Pacific? Let me, so so you ran. At, I woke up. No, I woke up at at uh, at like eight. 8 a.m. here, I think. Right. Yeah, I woke up at eight, so I was like getting up at six. Totally. So, what, and there was snow on the ground. But it's also uh, in the wake of having done a podcast with Matthew Walker the other day, who's the sleep expert guy, and he mm-hmm. talks about how important eight hours is, and right. you gotta get eight hours no matter what. So I've graduated out of that, like I have to get up at the crack of fuck no matter what. Right. Vibe, which you're still on board with. I, I, I am. And as you get, I will tell you this, as your senior, Right. As you get older, that sleep becomes a little bit more elusive, especially when you travel across time zones and you're yep. in hotels and stuff like that. I'm only taking advice from older dads. Okay. That's like my new that's thing. My, that's one piece of advice. And, and we played this out a little bit because in, in kind of trying to plan the itinerary for this trip, you were getting all hopped up. And I was like, I had to throw <laughs> totally. a little brain on that parade because you're like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And I was right. like, whoa, dude, like I have to, make sure that I execute on these podcasts at the yeah. highest level that I'm capable of. And if I overbook myself, I'm not gonna be prepared. I'm gonna be tired. I can't just be running in a million diff- different directions. Yeah, you did like a Papa Bear, like reply all email <laughs> yeah. that was like, it was very unfun. You were like, <laughs> like not, a, you were a downer. <laughs> yeah. And, but but just, yeah. just so you know, for future like trash talk that will come your way from yours truly, like that worked, it was a good method. Right. And the, the email was, I think most of the cats in this room were on there, it was like, it was like, I need to focus on what I came there for. I was like, oh <laughs> shit, sorry, dad. Um, but yeah, you know, like in, in tribute to you coming and that smackdown of an email. Uh, I was nice that, in the email. You put me in my place. Yeah. I also, uh, leading up to this, uh, have been getting more sleep. And uh, with the ride to downtown and back, I've started calling that. Like I've been like nicer to myself to be right. like, oh. So you ride your bike and I'll, and in, I'll, this, and, in the city every day, which is 20 miles and you go back and forth, right? And, and I'll count that as my workout, right? So like, instead of having to get up and do something and then the ride, <laughs> mm-hmm. I've just been like, okay, Rich is coming. I'm gonna cut back on the beers, get better sleep and just call my bike ride good enough. It's still 40 miles of riding. If you hit that hard, that's pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, so if I seem like extra on it, today, uh-huh. it's because I'm getting better sleep. Right, well, this is what I want. Yeah. Because this is for the ages, my friend. Totally, this is locked in but forever. But speaking of the, the the little jog that I did this morning, I mean, running around. Yeah, where'd you go? We're right in downtown. I mean, I don't really know where I am. So I just kind right. of ran around the, the streets and the buildings yeah. and the bridges and stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, it was eerie. Like everything is boarded up, everything is shut down, barely any people out. Um, you see media, media trucks, you see a lot of um, tripods and cameras and you know people getting ready to cover what's going on. Yeah. You had been sharing pictures of police presence and like Humvees and stuff like that. I didn't see that much of that this morning, but it was still pretty early. Perhaps that happens as we get towards evening, but it was strange. You know, it was strange to be in a city that I'm not familiar with just kind of, it's my favorite thing to wake up in a new city and just, I don't even look at a map or anything. I just go outside and run around and try to get a feel for the vibe. Right. But there's like no vibe. There's no vibe. Because there's nothing, well, happen, and there's just, nothing going on. And, uh, and getting in last night, we couldn't get any food because there's no delivery. And like, it was, it was like a whole, I was like, oh my God, we might not be able to eat. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Well, cause that was a travel disaster story right. of like no food, I didn't eat well, all day. I just day. figured like, usually the worst case scenario is you get like room service spaghetti, which we did, but it was really expensive and not that much food. And I was like, this isn't gonna do it. Now right. we gotta find somebody who's gonna deliver to us. And I ordered through DoorDash, they charge your credit card and then they cancel totally, on you. Totally. So like $250 right. later, yeah. you're I'm into thinking a thousand, like, you're into I a thought thousand. I had food coming <laughs> and then they tell me, no, it's not right. coming, but we're still gonna take your money. Um, I yeah. went into a mild panic. The, um, the let's see, the the part about the police presence here right now is frustrating because I was, and I know that this is a can of worms, so I'm not gonna, we don't have to get into this, but like every time I see a Humvee or a bunch of armed guards with machine guns here in downtown Minneapolis, I wonder, I just think about January 6th. I just think about mm-hmm. what that staff looked like on the steps of the Capitol. Um, so that, so there's that. Um, and then I, I, I wanna circle back on something you said because 
I, I told you some jokes last year that, that landed pretty well, um, which was just about how thoughtful your podcast was, but I was for the first time so in my head, kind of about everything going on that I kind of, I kind of fell off the rich roll podcast. Like, I, like, yeah, I know, but it feels good to say it on the show, right? Yeah. So, but then, um, but one of the conversations, so, but, but not completely, I was still probably doing an episode a week, okay? Um, love John Sally, that just, I love that he always has to go pick up his daughter. It's like my favorite thing. Yeah, he, um, keeps, he keeps having a bail. I middle. love that. <laughs> but in the conversation you had with Knox Robinson, shout out Knox, you, you examined something that you just said just now, which was this idea of like, when you get to a new city, you like to go run around. I am completely the same way. Mm -hmm. um, but to the run world, to the white folks in running, like if you feel that same way, explore a city on foot, like it's so, you know. And I, I never I, think twice right? about it. And I've done it all over the world. Totally. I've, I've done it in At night, Muslim countries. Just and, whatever. You know, you know, all kinds of crazy places. Globally never just, we're the, yeah. About my safety once. Split shorts. Should I bring a phone? Nah. Mm -hmm. And so, like again, like I try and find points of entry to see the see white privilege, and like for the running world, like if 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 you like to explore a city that you don't know on foot, like let's look at that. Like, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm not calling you out; I'm calling all of us because yeah, no, I completely no, no, agree. No. When I travel, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, what is Baltimore like? I'll just go trot around. And so I think that that's like that's another way of looking at it. Um, but when you had. So you were saying when Knox came out to visit, because I want to talk about that too. Oh, yeah. you, got, you spent like a whole week with that guy, right? Yeah, well, I think so. And he was definitely on the Brogan itinerary. Oh yeah. And that was all shared in Technicolor on Instagram yeah, stories. Yeah, we used the phones. <laughs> yeah, there was we a used, lot of phone use. We used that pink <laughs> app quite heavily. Um, uh, so I'd reached out to Knox last summer. Uh, actually, I think I'd seen him uh, in the sit down that you had for the Rich Roll podcast which I think you did in Los Angeles. It was like the black drape thing. It was when the you second, started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you he started came doing in that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it was like right after that, I think. Shortly after that. And I wanted um, I wanted to amplify a voice of credibility in run, but not just someone that, um, you know, and again, Knox doesn't speak for black people in running, uh, but he has his own experience and, and he has his own set of identities. And I, I also know Knox mm -hmm. and like, ran into him at a million events and like, you know, he's got a kid and got a couple kids now. And so I've always liked him. And so um, I threw him the invite as we were getting ready to host the meeting of the minds, uh, November, November Project Summit virtually. And it was just gonna be another piece of content. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he came out. Like one thing I didn't understand, first of all, he said yes right away. Like he said, Knox Robinson said yes so fast. I was like, I was wondering if there was like a-, like a Nobody traveled more during the pandemic than, than that guy. <laughs> totally. I would hit him up with a film. And he, he went would, to Africa. He would send one right back. He'd be like, yeah, I'm in Mexico City. I live here now. Right, he was living like, down what? there. Yeah, so but anyway, he said yes so quickly. Um, and it was it was uh, a really beautiful conversation that, that we were able to share kind of just catching up on our timeline of like what the Black Roses was, what they were doing when it was he and Jesse and how he sees run and, and and taking over spaces and, and mm -hmm. it was, um, <laughs> you know, we recorded that in my garage and it was great. I thought it was really great quality and beautiful. Um, but it really was the time around, you know, riding bikes in the, with the leaves changing, yeah. and it was fall. And, um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, I think having Knox here, you know, going back to what my mom said, it's like, there's folks in New York and Los Angeles and there's a lot of America in between, you know? And to have you here or to have Knox come to Minneapolis, Minnesota, or the Burbs where I live now, mm -hmm. it's like, it was cool. It felt good, you know? Mm -hmm. And with all that's going on here now, um, it's just a reminder that like, there's a, there's a lot of communities that are going through a lot of hurt, you know? Yeah. And, and um, I have friends in San Diego that still don't really know where I live. I mean, they call it Mindianapolis. <laughs> Mindianapolis. Yeah, because if you're not on a coast, then you're, right. just, you're just in some no man's land that right. doesn't count. Um, so yeah, so that was th those those were important times, and um, and but again, that was for that was for a gathering that's usually a couple thousand people called the November Project Summit, and just mm -hmm. to have a virtual offering and a couple live things. It was just like, you know, mm. yeah. Mm. But, so so. Uh, a lot has happened since the last time we sat down. A lot has happened. You got a kid now. I got a kid now. I'm a dad. You are a dad. I'm a dad. We've had some good dad conversations. We have. 
We have, and I, I feel like I feel like that's my connection to to you and this show, which is just like I like people that are out there grinding. I like people out there that are athletes in, in whatever stage of life. But if you're a dad, I, I feel like I feel a connection to that, you know. And so you're born to be a dad. Born to be a dad. Yeah. I, I, like I'll you're, take that you are like. I mean, you're like a dad, dad. Oh, I'm in it. Yeah, I'm in it. I th- yeah, I think you know. I could have been a better dad to this baby. I, the baby thing is kind of like a lot of standing around, you know? Mm-hmm. And now that my kid is three, he turned three in February. Um, so let's say, okay, so we did a podcast in February, 2017. My son, Lumi, was born. Lumi was Lumi born. Cobra. Lumi Graham. Look at that. Was born. Like, when I say you were born to be a dad. This is who I am. Wearing, and my so shirt's if you're just listening and you're not watching, you're wearing a tie-dye in. shirt. And I tucked in my it doesn't, shirt. It doesn't just say Lumi's dad on it. It's like if sewn onto the front of it. Yeah, and your shirt, when you're a dad, you should just start tucking in your shirt too. You That's are, another thing. Yeah. Get into jogging, tuck in your shirt, read the paper. I got I got the print <laughs> on Sunday now. So I'm drinking coffee, reading and the paper typing, with a tucked in shirt. It's typing like, it's letters over. on like an ancient I'm typewriter. typing letters. I mean, yeah. it's, and I, you know, I like on the here, when you, you just give me your phone number, you did the plus, plus one. And then in parentheses, <laughs> zip code. <laughs> like it's the forties. Yeah. So my shirt's tucked in, I'm reading the Sunday Times and I'm ripping out typewriter stuff. Uh, yeah, so Lumi, yeah, so he was born a year after the thing when we sat down. Um, I, 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 I've said this before to friends and I, I said it on a couple other things, but um, I was traveling so much during that time that I was, um, I was a little freaked out that I would not wanna be home, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, cause you hear sometimes, uh, uh, Friends of mine that are men, that are dads, do that kind of old brother. Oh man, it's a lot, it's stressful, it sucks or whatever. Being you know? at home or being on the road? Being at home. Right. And but so you I- also hear lots of guys talk about how, how, how stressful it is to be traveling all the time. And I think one thing you and I share is like, I love, I love yeah. I'm like, I'm not that guy. Like, right. I love airports, I love like totally. everything. It's like, I get to time travel. Like, right. How cool I'm is that? I'm nowhere right yeah. now. Yeah. Right, I'm in the Houston airport. I'm no, I'm, I don't mm-hmm. exist. It, so, so I was traveling so much and so thrilled by that. And like my sister-in-law said, I was coming to life on the road. I was concerned that like, I'd be one of those dads mm-hmm. that like, you know, like problematic. Like, uh, yeah. like I'd come home and be like, wah, wah, this you're sucks. Like, you're like Jeremy Renner in the grocery store looking at like detergent and breakfast totally. cereal. And like, just being like, about- get me out of here. <laughs> and I wasn't that yeah. way. I still came to life on the road, but like I was, when I was home, and I think Goldie could say this for sure. When I was home, I was home, you know? Mm-hmm. And. But the ability to be fully present and grounded at home is, you know, informed by getting fueled up by those experiences on the road. Yeah. And I think when people talk about exercise to make your, yourself the best self so that you can be in relationships better. You can be at your, your best self at work. Um, and so to keep up yourself, you know, and for me, that also applies to like um, the social engagement, uh-huh. coming coming to life on the road, and 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 not even really late nights, not even really like you know, nothing too like you know R rated, nothing that fun like traditionally, but um, just still being myself and a dad at home, being individual but also being married. You know, like I think you fall into those things of like that's your role, that's all you are, and so. Um, I was really pumped to come home to that little baby. And, and now that he's a toddler, like he actually is fun instead of mm-hmm. like, I think we love our baby. He's getting bigger. Diapers. Uh-huh. He's like a year or two of that, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, they start becoming real people. And yeah. And it gets really fun. Yeah, and you know, and so now, so almost every day, on Monday through Friday, I have on my calendar, Lumi, Lumi time, which is like, uh, around five o'clock until he goes to bed, which is like six, seven, eight, depending on whatever. Uh, and it's awesome. And we go stumble mm-hmm. around the woods or like pretend to go fishing and like just kind of fumble through stuff, you know, climb trees. Like it's like the stuff, and, and I hate to be this way, but it's like, you know, we got a big front yard, big backyard. It's like, it's kind of why we moved here, right? Mm-hmm. So, and those of you who are on the Instagram that follow Goldie, uh, she announced yesterday that we're having yeah, a second kid. I know, it's exciting, man. Congrats. We're having a daughter, we're having a you little are. girl. You are. Which is great. We we have enough white dudes. There's there enough a white dudes. There was a little bit of a. There was a, you were like thinking though. Well, the, what the, I was the thinking. Gears you know what I was thinking. Yeah. You know what I was what? thinking. Um, I don't know that I know. Well, 
Um, I, I think that the understanding uh, and the growth in our society, but definitely in my household and definitely for me personally around like gender and what matters and identity and, and then going to this baby gender reveal kind of vibe of like, we're having a, like, mm-hmm. I think, I, th- I thought if I was paying attention, we're supposed to not like even talk about it mm-hmm. or like, it seems outdated to pop the balloon and the pink confetti comes down and right. we say, girl, and that and you means definitely don't want dresses. Fi- you don't want fireworks. Right. So I remember seeing people on, on social media there. being like, we're doing the reveal and being like, <laughs> what? I didn't know we we're still doing that. So, yeah. so I, that's I my pause. Uh, yeah, I don't think, well, I don't know what it's, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I guess it, it might be a regional thing too. I don't know. It depends on where you live, I suppose. Right. But um, the progressive uh, notion is that we no longer do that. We're not doing that. Yeah. And so, so then this is like, man, all right, I'm telling the story. I came home on my bike, my, uh, my in-laws were visiting, Jen and Gary were visiting and I was a little bit late and I could tell Goldie was agitated. She's like, we're doing the thing, we're doing it. And I was like, what, I don't, what are we talking about? Her mother had, had, had talked to the doctor on the phone. So her only person who knew if you're having a boy or a girl was Jen. And she had gone to the store and got a big balloon and we were doing a gender reveal. And in that moment, I had to decide like be Scrooge and ruin Christmas and like take the energy out of it. And like, we're not doing that. And her mom, it's like a nice thing for her mom, whatever. And I even said to Goldie, I was like, I, are we doing that? And then I realized like, shut up, shut up. Mm. Don't ruin the moment. And it just, but just, but maybe we can, but it goes back to, it goes back to the anti, anti-racism. It's like, maybe I can have a conversation with Jen and I can ask Goldie, we're not gonna post the pink balloon popping. That's a bad, we're not doing that. But maybe we can engage and have these conversations. And then we all kind of win. I wish we didn't did it, do it, we did it. And we popped it. Okay, so then I was kind of Scrooge on the inside and smiling on the outside. Okay, cool. I didn't stand up for much. Okay, great. And then we sent it to our really good friends in San Diego who have a boy and a girl. And they sent us back a video of them watching the reveal. Uh And they were jumping up and down and screaming and crying. And it was like so beautiful. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Okay. Mm. So that's just a lot of words. I, I don't, gender reveal. It's complicated these days. Right? Yeah. So we're having, a, so, so go back to the top. We're having a girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, we're having a baby. Yeah, it's cool, man. No, we're stoked, um, we're stoked. Yeah, I love, I love the videos that you share online with you and, and Lumi and Goldie. Yeah, it's thank cool, you, man. We're stoked, yeah. we're stoked. And with a mom named Goldie and a dad named Brogan and an older brother named Lumi, I think we should name this girl Sarah. Or Katie. just go straight up the middle. You mean <laughs> like Emily? Yeah, just, middle name Elizabeth. Just because you you need a you need a straight you need a straight man. Right. Like you can't you can't have everybody can't be no, completely totally, wacky. Totally. I mean, let's be clear. It's not just Lumi. It's Lu, It's Lumi Cobra. Lumi Cobra Graham. Where does that come from? Um. So when we found out when we found out we were pregnant, when we found out Goldie was pregnant, um, new age stuff. And this is a dad thing. I'll teach you because you're a little bit further down the road. Apps, people have tracking apps, okay? So you say like, oh, you know, there's the due date. And then the, kind of every week will be like, oh, mm. now it's the size of a grape. And, and it gives yeah, you like- I missed all that. It's cool, but it, and it actually is cool. But you have to put in a placeholder name. So the app will spit out, it'll say like baby Graham or something. Uh-huh. And so, um, and Goldie's a yoga instructor. And so uh, one of the poses is called baby Cobra. It's like a, you're laying on your belly, you kind of lift up, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know how we plugged that in, but it was kind of cute. She was still teaching. So I'd go to her classes and she'd say, let's all come into Baby Cobra. And we all kind of, kind of wink at the wife. It was beautiful, it was great. Um, but the further we got like into her pregnancy, I, we were looking at each other like, and we're referring to Baby Cobra. Like we're talking about, Kate. Right. oh, I can feel Cobra. You know, it's like, <laughs> we started looking at each other. We're like, okay, she's Goldie, I'm broken. We're like, are we really doing You're, this? This is actually gonna We've happen. gone too far. And then she's looking at me like, and she's outrageous with the names. And so she was like, She's looking at me like for the voice of reason. She's looking at me as the voice of reason. <laughs> and she's like, um, I don't think we, I don't, what do you? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess this is gonna be what it is. And then we're just uh, like, what is that? What does that do to a person? Send them into the world as Cobra. Mm-hmm. The pasty white San Diegan. But you can get away with it as the middle name. Right, so we hit it. Yeah. 
So it's kind of like- If you're mm-hmm. coming in hot with Cobra as the first name, right. that's, a, that's a heavy load. So now it's kind of a parlor trick, because yeah. how often does your middle name come up? What's your middle name? David. David, it's so boring, so is mine. Mine's, yeah. uh, it, mine's pretty much David. Mine's Christopher. Uh-huh, same thing. It's the same thing. That's the same, they got, they got those names out of the same pile. Right. Does yours have significance? James, Stephen. Right. Well, it was my grandfather's name. Yeah. My, my, um, my grandmother, so uh, my kid's great-grandmother's maiden name was Rocker. And I think Whoa. that's a cool first name. Yeah. Anyway. What if, what if I married a Rocker? Right. Then that woman's name would be Rocker Roll. Rocker the Roll. Blank, rocker Roll. Rocker Roll? Yeah. Taking roll call? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, I want Adam's job. Uh, you're gonna have to come and do some guest hosting spots. Uh, like, and, and I, the reason I, I'm, the reason listening to his you're stuff. You're a good hype man. I I'll, would be into I'll give it. You that. Well, and the thing is, the reason I'm re- I really despise that guy is because he does a good job. <laughs> and and I like good. him. Adam's very good. Yeah, I mean, with the four- He's by- risen to the occasion, for sure. And it's been great. But Every- I did, I also, uh, I re- you know, one of the things that I had in mind when we were thinking about this tour and these live events right. was I wanted to have you involved. And we right. talked about it because, you're like the ultimate hype man. It would get be out great. on stage and get everybody excited. It would be great. And I'm still down to do it. That was one of the many ideas uh-huh. we've canceled on. Adam has job security though. Yeah. What does he do? He he's my he's my hype man. Is that his full time gig? No. Oh. He's geez. a he's a New York Times correspondent. Got it. Contributor. Got uh, it. He's an author. He wrote he co wrote Dave Goggins' book. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So and he's written his own books and he's working on a novel. He does lots of stuff. When I, when the, it's called Roll On, when you, the two of you are just yeah, chopping yeah. it up. When, when those episodes come up, because I want his role so bad, his job so bad, mm-hmm. I, I press play on those podcasts like this, like you an hate, angry. You hate listening? Yeah, I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> and then I listen to it, I'm like laughing to stuff. And uh-huh. I'm like, no. And Here's I'm like, the thing, I'm though. using the discount codes and shit. I'm like, There's okay, a lot okay. of work that goes in behind the scenes to hey. show up. We have this robust outline. He's reading all kinds of stuff. We're talking throughout the week about what we want to talk about. So homework, so, homework is involved. And then, but I'm like this kind of like I'm like a field reporter, kind of like I volunteer my marketing uh-huh. ideas. And you said Goggins, so I've got to roll this out. This um, I I throw you ideas and like nonsense like all the time. You mostly get back to me. And I remember talking to the I phone. I say mostly. No, you do, you get back. Do I? But you, um, you, one time I threw this idea, we were on the phone. I think we were actually faced, uh, I think we might've been on the telephone. You know, smartphones still have the feature where you can just call someone. <laughs> right. We were on the telephone, good old fashioned telephone call with Rich Roll and I was like, oh man, I was on a bike ride. You don't remember this. I was like, I was on a bike ride and I thought of this funny shit because I was listening to you and a couple key words came up. Do you know where this is going? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, you got to do rich roll bingo and and just like have these bingo boards out there and then when people hear like a key word they can like they can play along uh-huh i know so many endurance athletes are like doing like you know marathons and stuff but it was the one time in our friendship where you were like flatline you were just like it was ba- you might <laughs> with your silence you said I don't like that like idea. Like this drinking game, whenever I say some word that I always say all the time. Totally. Yeah. And, and you, so, so but, often, when, I, when, I, when I'm in the creative space, you, know, you pay attention to those moments where someone's like, oh, that's a bad idea. And you're like, okay, we'll finesse it this way. But instead of doing that, I just went ahead and created it. Yeah, I know. You know, did you see it? Well, you started mocking me. You were, you were mimicking me on Instagram and you did like, so, well, let me preface this by saying when, I was getting ready to go on this trip. My boys, who are now 26 and 24, who have been living at home since the pandemic, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to Minneapolis. I'm going to see Brogan, and they're like, the Instagram takeover guy. Yeah, like they were like, I love that guy. So, so this you would is, go on Instagram and pretend that you're. Oh my god. So this you were is, taking over, and then right. you would you would act like I me. would you pretend would like Rich did a takeover of my handle, and I would like speak like very thoughtfully and unpack the, a lot of things. Talking about homework. So this is, and then we can do this. So this is, and this won't catch so, on. And I didn't talk to Adam you, about this. If people are just listening, you literally handed me a bingo game chart. Read what it says so from the Rich top. Roll, so podcast bingo, how to play. Tune into any episode of the Ritual Podcast. <laughs> yep, any episode. You can go back and there's like a thousand of them. <laughs> Link for keywords and mark each space with a cutout piece below. The first listener with five in a row will win. Many will play, many will win. Yeah, peace. peace long pause, plants. Now read some of the so keywords here. here yeah, on the chart, five five. the keywords. 
I like how at the bottom too, you have a little scissor thing to cut out right. like your poker chip. This is this is interactive. This is like a lot of work. This took me 25 minutes <laughs> right. of love for the organization. So, so here's what here's what you get on the pink on the on rich the roll bingo. bingo. Just can you say it again? Rich roll bingo. Can you just say it? Rich roll bingo. It flows. It's nice. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. John Joseph mm -hmm. is right there at the top. Top left. left. Yeah. So let's go back to the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Refuel. Uh huh. Gut health. Endeavor. Goggins. Yep. <laughs> mindset. There's gonna be a lot of winners. Ultra in this game. health. Decoding. Dot com slash rich roll. A lot of that. Yeah. There's a lot of well, that. Well, cause now you're doing those in the middle of the show. Right. Right. Studio <laughs> right. right in the middle. You just have the symbol, like the Prince yeah. symbol. Is that is that upside down? I couldn't figure out how to put that right. It, it goes, which I, I think you did it right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Authentic, spirituality, recovery, Julie, precipice, new, new book, book. Yep. subscribe, hindsight, and, and even deeper yep. look, swim run. Yep. <laughs> Paradigm busting yeah. and vegan. I was gonna do the cheese that yeah. your wife, what's Julie's cheese? You're missing a few off? here though. Oh, Shremo? Shremo. You're missing a few. Uh, well, you can unpack. I thought that was your favorite. I, that is my favorite. Let's, let's land this plane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I can't wait. Like so, so what you could do is you could knock this all out. Like uh -huh. you could just really rich roll it up in the first 10 minutes. And I like, think everybody would win in short shrift. And then they get a this. discount code for right. 10,000 shorts. All right. Um, I appreciate the effort. Thank you. And I like how it's colorful and I you, think it'll you used connect. all the fonts and everything. I just, look, I'm, I'm gonna keep coming with ideas. What do we do with this though? Raise money for charity maybe. There you go. Yeah. It, Rich Roll Bingo is on. <laughs> okay. Rich Roll Bingo is on. But I'm serious about next time you blow through Southern California, you gotta drop in on a session with Adam and I and- I and would love to. Chime in and participate I in, would the love to. On, in the roll on endeavor. To, to, for his shout out, especially especially with the Goggins thing that he did, the four by four by 48, I love, I was walking on Lake Minnetonka in the frozen whatever, and I was listening to him talk about running and then you talk about training. And it was like this really beautiful thing where he, and I hope this isn't insulting, I, I mean it as a compliment, but he, ta he was talking about running in a way that more people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't wanna call him a couch to 5K, he's way more than that, but it was like, he was approaching run with like, I think he said like 25 miles a week, like trying to mm -hmm. trying to get into it. And you were like, phase two, hang on, well, how are you? And you were like, you were trying to help him, but it was almost like you guys were like, it was like too far a little bit. Uh -huh. And I thought it was awesome. Cause you have so many listeners who are super serious athletes, but also people who, Move a little, mm -hmm. you know. And I thought it was beautiful. I no, I think Adam. Adam is very relatable in that regard. Like he's aspirational in the things that he's trying to do with his running and his swim run and fitness and all that kind of stuff. But I think he does sit in the position of you know more of the listeners in terms of like how they think about these things. Yeah, and then how did it go? Did he crush it? Did he do the he, thing? He did great. Yeah. yeah, I rode my bike down and and like checked on him a couple times. Was it? Did he it get got through? Did it, it get ugly at the end? He got, he did pretty good. Jason oh, cool. over here actually did it as well. So they were checking in with each oh, other throughout awesome. the whole that's time. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I was coming off the knee thing. I was not gonna do that, but I was, stoked right. for, I was stoked for him. Were you uncomfortable that you couldn't rise to the occasion? Absolutely. Instead snowshoeing out onto Lake Minnetonka, like looking for fishermen yeah, to and, talk to. And it's he, surprising you haven't started a podcast. Too much work, man. That's it? Anybody who could put together this podcast bingo chart could probably rich spin roll pod. A, you just got to say the whole thing. Podcast. Rich roll podcast bingo. Okay. The Goggins thing is crazy, and I TM. think I'm, I will <laughs> totally. I will do the. Um, I will do the four by four by forty eight. I um, Goggins has been on your show now. I'm not joking, but Goggins has been on your show like four times. No, no, twice. Oh, okay. He's in the twice club with uh, mm. yours truly. Mm -hmm. No, but um, I am inspired by Goggins. I liked um. Goggins called a, a friend of mine's dad um, who was battling cancer. Mm. This was just a few months ago and left him a voicemail. Wow. Um, and you know, Steve Prognell. Yeah. Uh, so it's his dad. Yeah, 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 wow. And the two, the Steve and his, his dad, um, you know, read the Goggins book and the whatever. And so um, I'm not even a huge Goggins fan, but when I heard his voice, like in this really matter of fact way, talking to Steve's father about taking this thing head on and like, you got this. I was just like, okay. I call, I got Steve on the phone and I was like, um, well, you you definitely have to do the four by four before, mm -hmm. you know? And it was like, yeah. he only had a few weeks and he's in great shape, but 
um, I don't need to know much more about Goggins because that was like a really well placed, perfect. That's like, beautiful. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. And and Steve's dad is doing much better. That's cool. Um, so Steve's the he's the November project leader in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah, and he's at like one of the earliest fans of this podcast mm-hmm. and. Um, and you know, frankly, he's he's a, a friend of mine that I get to know through November yeah, it's Project. Yeah, cool. it's cool. He visited us at our house yeah. several years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, he came on in 2017, and um, they've been doing a great job in Buffalo mm-hmm. ever since. He's also like Mr. Connector in that city; like everyone knows him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, back to Lumi. Back to Lumi. Yeah. So so in 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 your dadding, um, I guess he's probably not old enough to really understand kind of what's going on in this city that he lives in, right? Do you feel like uh, you, ha- you, can you talk to him about all of this stuff yet or not? So can you talk to him? So um, I have, I have friends that are um, most excited about anti-racist work through the lens of being parents, right? And what history classes we took and what things we learned about the United States and like, how do how will that look for this next generation? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I'm very interested in that. Um, and I, I'll be completely honest, I haven't had those, I haven't yeah. begun those conversations. He has a hard time sitting still and we, you know, he's, he's into- He's too young. He's into coral reefs yeah. and things like that, but, yeah. I, I, but, but not too far off to be honest. And, uh-huh. you know, I, I was speaking to some other dad friends um, where, you know, especially last summer here, uh, living in uptown and, and the the very organized uh, peaceful protests and some of the riots, like I remember seeing it, um, whether it was on TV or just listening just out my front window and thinking like, I gotta be out there. That's, I wanna be in the mix with people. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the leaders in San Francisco reminded me this week that like there are, there are other ways that you can have as much or much more impact, but but going back to what we said earlier about who I am and how I connect and how I participate. Yeah, I would imagine you're like, yeah. I need to be right in and the I'm middle like, of work. And I'm like, honey, I gotta go. Happening. And she's like, you're not leaving us here, mm-hmm. that vibe. And so that was a real like push pull for like the fatherhood thing of like. What is your responsibility? Right, and, right. and, and where is your time best spent? Yeah, yeah. and so, um, you know, but I, I did, and I still do take him out on the bike seat, the little bike seat on the back. Dad life, man, tuck in the shirt, uh-huh. kid goes on the back and, um, and we, uh, we would go to some peaceful marches and protests and things. And I would talk about how these are mommy and daddy's friends and everyone's wearing black and, and um, Black Lives Matter. And we've been to the George Floyd uh, Memorial. Now it's called George Floyd Square. Um, I went once by myself. And then the next day I took just, just Lumi. Um, I didn't like Goldie know, um, but then the three of us went the next day, um, which has its own which has its own kind of set of opinions, which is just kind of this tourist vibe of like going to the place where this unarmed black man was killed. Yeah, and, and which is something we're gonna, I think we're gonna do after this podcast, right? And it, it is a loaded thing. Like you don't wanna be a looky loo. Like how do you approach that with the correct level of like respect and appreciation? It's not about your Instagram moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and this was a conversation that came up with Knox when he visited. You know, I said, I said to him, and I said to you, which is like, um, if we don't go, I understand. Um, from a personal uh, point of view, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's important. Any steps closer you can take to the reality, I encourage. And I know I'll get blowback for just even saying that. And and for me to take my kid there and my wife and we have we took pictures and you know, um again, supercharged with privilege, but like George Floyd and our move to Minneapolis, and I don't know how much longer we'll be here. We could he could you know, go to college at the U. You know, mm-hmm. this could be where we are forever. But if we aren't, or if we are, his first history lesson that he lived through that he knows is George Floyd. And we and we we went to the place where he was murdered mm-hmm. in broad daylight. And I, I look if if that if there's some judgment there, and um, I not only do I understand it, but I, I like I see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, like I think I think keeping kids in cocoons and not not telling these stories is absolutely wrong. You yeah, hundred percent. So I then, agree with you on so that. then it's you know. You know that corner on 
Chicago Ave is, you know, 0.4 from where we lived, you know. Mm-hmm. I've ridden my bike on every corner of the city. So, yeah, we're going to go. One of the things that we've talked about a couple times on on FaceTime with respect to, you know, being a dad is the challenge of trying to figure out like what that means in 2021, right? Mm-hmm. You're no longer Don Draper who's going out and doing whatever as long as you're paying for everything. Right. Um, you can't just be the super sensitive guy. You're expected right. to be strong, but also emotionally available and sure. vulnerable at just the right time. Right. You have to be the good listener, but you also have to be the person who knows how to erect the boundaries <laughs> while making uh, you know a living that's going to support the people right. That, that, right. that you share a, a home with. Right. And it can be overwhelming and confusing yep. to know what that roadmap looks like for you. Uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's a stress that it's also not cool to complain about. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's not much of a space for men to be like, "Wow, this is a lot." You know, yeah, I think you're supposed to you're supposed to have you're supposed to. I got this. You know, you're supposed to you know be on. So, yeah, it's it's complicated. I mean, you're, being you know. being yeah, I got like that's part of that is yes, and part of that is part of the problem. For sure, you know what I mean? Like just being for sure. like, I'm just going to buckle down and solve the problem. Yeah, isn't necessarily. How you solve the problem, right? And then, and then, and then, what stereotypes do we continue like supporting? And like, what do we still think is like the husband th- role thing? Like, for example, like around the house shit. Like, I didn't really want to necessarily move to the birds. We did, and like now we've got this house, and the house has like a water heater. What the hell's a water like furnace? I don't know. I'm just saying things now. A sink. I knew that one before. A uh, carpet, wood floors, things. So, so okay, a lawn. Okay, now I'm, I've got a, my shirts tucked in. It's, Says Lumi's dad, I'm pushing a lawnmower. It's all come, it's all coming to life. But I I've I've gotten some shade from like the moments where Goldie is like, hey, can you can you fill in the blank? Build the dresser or like hang mm-hmm. the lights or like the thing. And like I can't do it. I of can't that. do that stuff. And then I grew up in a house where I could we were kind of always doing projects and things, but like, so it always especially in my new like suburban house life, it feels like a fail to like call like a real guy uh-huh. with a tool belt and he owns the saw to come <laughs> saw my stuff, if right? If the washing machine breaks or whatever. Totally. Yeah. And so like, as if as if we buy a house and the dad then knows how to fix a dryer same day, it's like, <laughs> what are we talking about? So so I think pushing back on, yeah. so, so, so it would be like, you know, the stereotype. And I tell Goldie this, and she's like, are you pissed? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, explain yourself. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, you know, that's like a dad thing. I should be able to. Replace the ceiling fan or something, you know. And a lot of my homies listen. Just meaning disappointed in yourself because you feel like you don't, you can't live up to that. That's that, the role that stereotype. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, um, and I and I threw it back on her. I was like, that would be like me saying your cooking sucks. Like you can't cook. And then she's like, well, I can. And I'm like, yeah, shit. Yeah, you you're a pretty good cook. Okay, maybe I should learn how to fix the ceiling fan. You know, these stereotypes mm-hmm. like what our roles are, and so. Um, I mean, going back to just the one-on-one time with your kid, putting your phone down and like how you talk to kids, like the the generations before us and also some of us had parents that didn't have all those conversations, mm-hmm. but didn't, didn't, weren't so open. And, you know, I really admire the parents who have a relationship with their kids where, you know, for most of their childhood, for sure, maybe up until their teenagers are coming to their parents and asking questions, right? Yeah. And if you don't have that communication open, who's that on, right? Yeah. Mother or father or whatever, like I think that's on the parent. So th- those are some good goals that fall outside mm-hmm. of the roles and the stereotypes. It's just like, I think I can do that. I do that with a lot of my friends, mm-hmm. with a lot of my guy friends, you know? And so. One of the things I've learned uh, as I continue to uh, <laughs> try to figure out this parenting thing, I've said this before, but the older boys are my stepsons. I had a hand in helping you know, navigate them into young men, but I wasn't their dad, but I was around all the time. Right. So I feel like on some level I participated in that. Do they know their dad? Um, Yeah, and he's since passed away and and their dad was great and he was a great dad. Yeah, yeah. So I was always very, you know, respectful and cautious not to overstep that boundary. Um, With these next two who are my children, um, it's been a lot harder. And when I thought I had a grip on what parenting was, I'm continually 
challenged and brought to my knees in yeah. ways I would have never imagined. And one of the things that I've learned to get back to my original point is no matter what you do, like that pendulum swings back and hits you in the ass. Sure. So when you're like, I'm gonna be the open dad totally. who tells them all totally. this stuff. No, I appreciate They reach that. a certain age and they're like, why are you telling me all this? Right, you're like an they're idiot. angry that like, you're an idiot. you should just be like, I just need to know that you've got it under control, right. you know? <laughs> But if you were that guy, then they'd be like, "Why didn't you tell me?" You know, it's totally. like it's it's rigged in a way that you're you, you're not going to win. Right, right. You're in a you're in this like weird mouse labyrinth right. that only leads to like you know damage control. Right, basically. right, right. And learning how to like come to terms with that and be okay with that has led to you know a lot of pain, but also some hilarious conversations and is with that, my so, wife. And is that for uh, for the two younger kids? Was that always that feeling or was that mostly teenage years? No, this is, this is, this is all kind of coming out yeah, as they reach it. teenage, you know, they're, they're, they reach a level of sentience and, and, and look, kids will try to identify by either um, becoming more like you, like they're gonna, mm -hmm. they're gonna take your lead and look up to you and be like, I wanna be like dad or I wanna be like mom, or they, try to craft their identity in opposition to who right, you are. Right, so right, we're right. in that right now. Right, right, where right. Where it's like, whatever we're doing, right. that's that's definitely the wrong way to do things. Right. And they have to figure it out for themselves. And as a parent, you're like, well, let's give them that opportunity. Totally. That Cause you want them to push, you know, their boundaries and figure out like what works for them and what doesn't, like that self-exploration, that differentiation, that, you know, trying to figure out who they are in the world totally. as, they, as they get older. Totally. But at some point you gotta put the guardrails up, right? Yep. But where do those go? Totally. Like it's just, it's so- You're stressing me out, Rich. Confusing, man. You're stressing me out. <laughs> Let's go back to and fishing. And I said to you like, when you when you said like, oh, we, you know, we're, we're gonna have another baby. I'm like, good, well in 15 years, you, totally. 15 years from totally. now, you'll be going to- <laughs> Totally, <laughs> totally. No, there was definitely like, you controlled some of this story. You controlled yeah. the pacing on this, which was like, you, you've said some very sweet things over the years where you're like, oh, I remember washing my kids in the sink and time flies. And, and when I see you with Lumi, I miss that. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm not in that stage anymore. And I have to and remind it's myself. it's so precious yeah. and just being 100% present for that. Like yeah. it's, it's such a cool time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, I just like, it cracks me up. Like, Matt, like for whoever's listening to this, imagine if Rich Roll was your dad. Like how wild is that? Like, and then you talk about the pendulum swinging, like so, like what? So like they're eating beef nachos, like and they're like just they think you're, you they think your shit is just terrible, <laughs> basically. Right. Yeah, right. you don't, so, don't. But one of the funny things that Julie, Julie and I will then go like when we're talking about it, she'll be like, we'll, we'll just joke, be like, there's all these people out in the world, they would love for us to be their parents. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally, totally. Because you know this thing like younger people do. Um, it's like internet speak in YouTube comments, they'll just say dad. Yeah. You know, like dad, like, oh, like you're the mentor that I need in my life. Or totally. whatever. So I get those comments on you, like dad, yeah. dad, yeah, dad, yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, but my kids, they're Thank like, you, yeah. no. Bonehead. No bueno. Yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, totally <laughs> yeah. nothing. But I mean, were you, um, when you were a teenager, what kind of teenager were you? I was, I was a um, super goody two shoes. Were you? Yeah, I was a grinder. I mean, I was, I got into, I mean, when I was, around 14 is when I started to get serious about swimming. So it was all about right. swimming. And then it became all about school. And I was very judgmental of anybody yeah, yeah. who was like out having fun and messing around. Cause I was like very directed. Yeah. But I was also socially awkward. Right. I was, you know, not a, not a, not a good looking kid. Yeah, you were socially had, distancing weird, back weird, in the, yeah. I was, yeah. You did it back, first. I was an OG yeah, social Yeah, yeah, you started this whole thing. Yeah. You know, I had weird looking glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you bad, still do. Bad haircut. And you still thing. do. So yeah, I know, yeah. right? No, I mean, like that's, that's the thing that I, I'm fearful of is, you know, I mean, I was a really bad teenager. Like going back to that Harvard statement, Stadium comment and the commentary about race, it's like, we would bend and break every rule. Like the, the story, and you know, I, I only have one other, other sibling, an older brother, two years mm -hmm. older. And he was a little closer to your end. It's just, he, he didn't break as many rules, but like, you know, I was this big, I was this big when I was 15 and a half years old. Wow, that's a lot of right? energy. And so my folks were divorced. And so I spent time in both houses, but like my mother had her hands full mm -hmm. with us. And so I just think about how I use my creativity and my energy back then and had a lot of it social connections. I had a lot of like traditional popularity and I used all of that to like fuck around. Mm -hmm. And so how did you slowly emerge out of that? 
Um, how did I slowly emerge out of that? Uh, it was a couple decisions towards the end of high school in what felt like really last chance opportunities and going back to the commentary on race, like this world wouldn't have been as uh, patient or kind mm -hmm. uh, to the, some of the things I did and got away with if I weren't a loud charismatic white kid, captain of the basketball team, kind of like that guy. I got into rowing at the end of high school. I barely graduated high school, but I got into rowing because people said like, you'd be pretty good at it and there's college opportunity maybe, but whatever. And I got into acting in high school. Mm -hmm. Other than that, yeah, I we talked about we talked about that on the first podcast. That's yeah. the that's the like less known. That's the yeah. That's like, the B plot. In yeah, your life. yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You, you could have gone this whole acting trajectory. Maybe I'm yeah. too big. I'm too big. But anyway, so 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 I picked up. I got into acting in my senior year of high school. I got into rowing, and these were two like cult worlds on their own. And I and they both grew very quickly. And they both were taking me away from that that idea of mm -hmm. I just didn't you know. I was, Right. It's kind of overdrive. And so then college became a thing and then Boston became a thing. And then I was surrounded with a bunch of definitely not straight laced, but like goal driven rower type, kind of preppy, kind of hardcore, like uh, jock dudes, right. college division one college athletes, yeah, yeah. you know? And from there you kind of like- A bunch of Winklevi. 100%, those yeah. guys were out there. Um, and so, so yeah, so that was, that was it. But you know, we still played in the margins and Saturday night still came. And like, mm -hmm. so when it comes to being a dad now, it's like, I don't, I wouldn't, I would be freaked out if I had, if he saw my playbook, you know what I mean? Mm. When it comes to like ruckus. So anyway, we'll see, to be continued. Yeah, but you know, the universe, God, whatever you wanna call it, rigs it in a certain way that you'll get your, your buttons pushed and you'll get challenged totally. in ways that you can't foresee. Totally. You know what I mean? And it's like, it puts right in front of you, whatever it is that you need to look at within yourself. 100%. You know? And I love that. I mean, the challenge of being a dad, right? It's the hardest thing I've done. And it's, I have a friend who's about to become a dad in like a couple of months. It is also, there's no second place. Like there's not even like, there's no podium. It's like the first, second and third best thing I've ever done, right? So it's so cool, right? Yeah. And it's the hardest, it's so hard. You just give up everything. I'm not complaining. <laughs> this should roll out on Father's Day, actually. You could bank it. When is Father's Day? It's like June or something. Maybe it will, we'll see. Yeah, you've got to give this one some yeah. air. Um, well, if we're going to do that, then you got to take it out. You got to take it out on a positive Father's Day. No, on a po yeah, on a po positive. Um, um, fa so letter, letter, you know, typewritten letter. Yeah, to the to the to the erstwhile fathers to be. Fathers to be, Francis St. John in in North County. Um, it's. I tell new dads this all the time. It's not like anything. It's not like, you know, going to grad school and late nights. It's not like being tired or sleeplessness. You know, it's not like, it's not, there isn't, there isn't a comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you also don't love anything like this. It's not like your favorite team home game against the Yankees. It's not like the best experience, you know, and so, I don't speak this way that often, but I really believe in it. And so, you know, when that comes planned or otherwise, and you're going to be a dad, it's like, don't try and understand it. Just live it, live it, live right through it, you know, and, and keep your eyes wide open, you know, and keep your phone far away from you. And ironically still take a lot of pictures somehow. Mm. And, um, and drink a lot of water. <laughs> Hydration. Say please and thank you. Hydration. I actually don't care a lot about about yeah. the rules in our house. Like wow, we're gonna raise Lumi mm -hmm. this way, but I drill the please and thank you thing my dad did. So if my kid is like this wacky loudmouth, but he says please and thank you a lot, I'm fine. That's good. Yeah. So to pick your battles, I would say that's an important one. Like how you think you're gonna shape your kid, good luck, it probably won't go that way. But if there are things that are worth picking your battle for, stick by it. The please and thank you thing, that's, mm. that's big. So, and then, um, and then don't don't think you're gonna figure it out. I used to surf with a guy who told me with all confidence, he was three or four weeks away from becoming a dad. He said, yeah, we decided we're not really gonna do a stroller. We're just gonna like, I don't know, I'll probably just get like a backpack or something. And like, <laughs> you know, Coachella's coming up. So like, we'll probably, I mean, definitely still going. And I was like, 
And you've done a good job of this, biting your tongue. But like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you have no idea. Like, like keeping your mm-hmm. own opinion on the side. Mm-hmm. There's times. Mm-hmm. There's times when so you know like, it's right. not about you. Like, yeah. Let so me, uh, let me know how that goes. I was like, cool. Yeah. No yeah. stroller, dope. Like, meanwhile, I didn't ever think I was. I have three strollers. Like, you know what I mean. So like this uh-huh. idea of like controlling the future. Like, you know. So, to my dads out there, you will never, you will never get the credit. And you, there's so much more to do. And 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 being a positive male role model. I think is an important thing. It's the best. And um, and and guide your kid to a, a life with with anti racist work in it, because mm-hmm. I think that that's the place where we can make the biggest change, the quickest change. Even though it seems like years and years, decades and decades, like mm-hmm. I think those are the changes we'll see quickest. So beautiful, man. Uh, there's only one thing that I would add to that, which is in those moments where you're being tested which are gonna be more frequent than you expect. And you feel like I gotta get out of here cause I gotta do that thing or mm. I gotta call that guy. It's just like, remember like this passes so quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. And when I see the videos of you with Lumi, I'm like, man, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Right. And then I look at my kids and they're so much older and you forget how quickly it passes. Yeah. And just to be able to be present and appreciate what's actually transpiring. It's it's great to say, put the phone away, but like, how present are you? Like we're yeah, gonna climb a, a tree point. and just forget about what your agenda is and just be. Cause it's not about like, I'm gonna create the ultimate day and we're gonna go to the amusement park. It's not about that. Right. It's just like, just be present with the kid yeah. and give that child your full attention. And yep. that's the most powerful and um, greatest gift that you can you can give. It's really well said. It's not the stuff. It's not the right mm-hmm. hamper. It's not the right wall color. No. It's not the crib. It's just like if you can do those things, you could be playing in a bucket of sand. You know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, so so that stuff, man. I, I really connect with that. So, um, once again, Rich Roll, it's been an honor, my man. I love you, brother. Love you too. Yeah, I'm this really super fun. proud of you for coming to the Twin Cities during this. Why? You gave me. I just didn't think uh, it was a reason to go on an adventure too. That's true. You know, That's and I'm, true. I'm really, I'm really happy to be here, and I feel um, excited about what I'm going to learn over the next couple of days. Yeah, yeah, it's an important, it's an important time. Mm-hmm. You know, b- before people start d- talking about what we're doing with our hours in this time during this time and the sensitivity around it, it just let's agree that it's an important time. Mm-hmm. And if you're a storyteller, and if people listen to you and you have influence in a platform which is undeniable, then you belong here. You need to be here, so. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for bringing me out. Peace, plants. Namaste.